So I hope you see my screen. Welcome everybody. I'm uh, Davide Sangalli from the Italian CNR. And uh, um, in this lecture, uh, I will introduce uh, the Yambo code and uh, the main features of the code. So we switch from Quantum Espresso that uh, you saw up to yesterday to this new Yambo code. Now this is a bit uh, the outline of uh, my presentation. So I will have a first part, which is uh, mostly focused on uh, on the code. Some so a few details details on the developers, uh, the features, uh, how we handle it, and then there will be two parts which are more uh, devoted to to the theory, and uh, in particular to the two main features uh, of uh, the Yambo code. Uh, which is uh, the description of uh, what is the uh, ab initio many body perturbation theory and uh, the introduction of the quasi particle concept, uh, and then the, the description of uh, accidents uh, within uh, the beta salpeter equation. And then I recall that uh, later there will be another lecture which is more focused uh, on the GW and on the quasi particle concept, uh, and uh, afterwards the tutorial will be on, on this part. So the Yambo code. Well, first of all, I have to say that uh, Yambo is uh, a code which implements uh, many body perturbation theory. There is also a part on time dependent density functional theory, but uh, the main focus of the code is really this many body perturbation theory. And it is implemented in a way that requires uh, a DFT simulation as a starting point. So Yambo is interfaced with uh, two well-known DFT codes. One is uh, Quantum Espresso and the other is uh, Abinit. And uh, in the past days, you have seen Quantum Espresso. So in, this, uh, uh, in the present tutorial, we will also start from uh, Quantum Espresso. So another ingredient uh, of the Yambo code is the interface with many libraries. Actually, this uh, picture is uh, a bit outdated. We have a few more as well. And so the idea is that uh, is a tool which is also take adv taking advantage of uh, these libraries for performances, uh, such as uh, MPI, of course, uh, the HD5 for parallel I/O, and many more. The, there is a, a long list of uh, developers. Uh, yeah, I tried to to put uh, as many pictures as I could, but uh, not all developers. I was arranging that yesterday, and uh, the idea is that. Uh, uh, Every, every developer uses Yambo as a tool for research. So the idea is to have in different projects for the, let's say the research goal, which are started within the code and then eventually made available. And indeed, this is the outcome. So the different projects, they lead to different physical properties, which can be computed. Here there is a list, quasi-particle properties, optics and excitons are the two, which we'll describe today. But then there will be also, there are also other like magnetoptics, decoism, electron phono, real time. And all these features are released uh, with a GPL license. And then uh, when there are, uh, let's say, pre GPL features, which are under development, which are in a, in a separate, in a different repository. And, uh, and the idea is that when these features are available, they will enter as well the GPL uh, version. So it is used for, uh, different kind of applications. Here, the idea of this picture, these uh, pictures is to show you that Yambo can be used uh, on 1D materials, 2D materials, extended system, or even molecules. Although it's a plain wave code, and it is mostly designed for extended systems. Now we have a website, which is the, the one you, you see in the middle. Uh, and uh, starting from the website, you can also find the link to the user forum. There is a, a wiki for, with uh, tutorials. And then there is a, a Git repository, which is hosted on, uh, on GitHub. Uh, we regularly organize the schools on uh, the use of the code. And uh, for example, SECAM schools, or uh, schools like the one, this one, either fully focused on the Yambo code or uh, in collaboration with uh, other codes. And there is a, a growing community of users which uh, we try to support at the school and uh, the forum. Now, as I said, today I will mostly discuss about uh, quasi particles, uh, and then uh, there will be a part on uh, optics and excitons. I also highlight that uh, in the last, uh, I would say, at least six, seven years, uh, there's been uh, a strong work on the, the development on uh, the real time part of the Yambo code 
which however I'm not going uh, to present today. So a few few words on uh, performances. This is uh, the only slide I have, uh, mostly because uh, in the first day, Andrea Ferretti was already showing uh, some performances uh, of the Yambo code on HPC systems. Here I, I use this uh, test case, which reports the let's say the last scalability test we did or the most recent we did of the with the Yambo code computed quasi particles. So this GW. On this system is a graphene layer on top of uh, a cobalt interface. And you see two different kinds of scaling. The first one is uh, based on MPI plus OpenMP. And uh, this is also the occasion to, to tell you that uh, in Yambo, there has been uh, a, a long work in, uh, in the last years uh, to optimize the code. So we started with uh, the MPI implementation, and then we added the OpenMP level. And uh, it has all been done within uh, the Max project. And uh, this is the, st the scaling test, are, uh, this one has been done on the Juice cluster. So in this case, Yambo is com uh, compiled with the Intel compiler. Uh, and here you see tests for running uh, Yambo in parallel uh, on uh, a cluster which has Intel course node. So more recently, we added to MPI and OpenMP also the, the ability to run uh, random accelerators. And this is the, the part that you see on the right. So the first uh, part which has been implemented and uh, which is now supported in the GPL part is uh, via CUDA Fortran. So if you want to run on uh, GPUs, uh, what you have to do, you have to compile uh, Yambo with the NVIDIA compiler. And so here I, I have highlighted that uh, when you run on GPU, you use the compiler, which is related to the NVIDIA card, as opposite to the case when you run uh, on CPUs uh, that you, you use uh, for, uh, let's say, the optimized ways to, uh, to use the compiler, uh, which is related to the, the processors. Now, as far as the user is concerned, uh, it, it doesn't change much in the sense that you, in both cases, uh, you, you run YAML with MPI run minus MP. You can eventually specify the number of threads, which is uh, important when you run uh, on course. It is not much important when you run on cart. And instead, the, say, the offloading of the data and of the simulation on the NVIDIA cards is done automatically once the code is compiled with the, the NVIDIA compiler, which is something you, you already find uh, when you log in on an HPC machine. Now, the, the other thing which I, I'd like to highlight here is that, uh, well, of course, the, the scalability of the, the code is good. So here you see on the right the efficiency and uh, increasing the number of course. Of, of course, the ideal situation would be to have efficiency 100%, which is uh, almost impossible to get, but uh, still on uh, 1,000 nodes, which in this case means uh, almost 10,000 cores, because here there are 48 cores uh, and each course has uh, Two threads. The code, the the code is uh, is doing a very good job. And then the, the other remark is that uh, running on on GPU, we, we get a very decent boost. So here, for example, if you want to compare the situation with two hundred uh, nodes here on, on CPUs, then on GPUs it would be the one with eight eight hundred uh, GPU cards because there are four cards per node. And then you see that the timing of the simulation drops uh, by an order of magnitude roughly even more. So here you have uh, 2,000 seconds, uh, 20,000 seconds, and here you have uh, a bit more than 2,000 for uh, 800 GPU card. So this is very nice. Then if you are interested, you can also find uh, all the benchmarks are available within the Max project. Now I, I switch more on, uh, on the theory part. So first of all, I, I will introduce what is uh, this ab initio many-body perturbation theory. Now, the idea is that we, we want to solve a many-body problem. This is the, the same issue we have uh, within density functional theory. And uh, the way we do that is uh, to start from a green function. So we define a green function, which is uh, a rather simpler quantity compared to the wave function, because it's just uh, two variables, r and r prime. However, the wave function is defined as the expectation value of the full interacting wave function. So yeah, from the definition, you don't gain much because you still uh, need to compute the, the interacting uh, ground state, which is a very complex object. 
But then within many body perturbation theory, you take advantage of the Gelman LO theorem. And basically, you rewrite this green function as an expectation value of, of the non interacting particle system. And this is something which you can compute easily. And then the role of the interaction, so this is B, the particle particle interaction, is taken into account here in this term. And you notice that there is a summation. So one of the advantage of uh, one of the idea of many body perturbation theories that you can truncate this uh, summation, which goes up to infinite order in the interaction and to, to monitor how the interaction affects uh, at any order the, the properties of the system. So an alternative to the truncation is uh, to rewrite uh, all this uh, effect of the interaction in the form of uh, a self-energy. And this is what you see here. So this uh, sigma exchange correlation contains uh, all the information about the interaction among particles. Now, before, uh, let's say, having a look to the self-energy, let me point out uh, why uh, one would like to start uh, with the green function. So one reason is that uh, starting from the green function, you can uh, compute the expectation value of any one body operator. But then the other, another important reason is that the green function has uh, what is called the Lehman representation. So you can uh, Fourier transform to frequency. Here is a function of t and t prime and of t minus t prime in particular if uh, your system is time invariant. And then you can switch to a function of the frequency. And the green function will have uh, a number of poles. And uh, this poles, uh, which can be expressed in uh, this way, is uh, expression you, you find, for example, in the Fetter Valeshka, can uh, describe uh, a photo emission experiment. So the poles of the green function describe uh, what is uh, the band structure of the system. You have the removal and the addition energies. Now, so far, we have taken uh, our full interacting system and we have split it into a non-interacting part uh, plus uh, a very complex uh, many-body self-energy which uh, about which we didn't say much up to now. So one point to remark is that this self-energy is frequency dependent. This means that if uh, our non-interacting system has a number of poles, a, a band structure that you can see in pot emission, the number of poles uh, that you, you will get in the interacting picture is much higher exactly because this uh, frequency dependence of the self-energy. However, what one can do is to use uh, this uh, quasi-particle approximation. Here I'm not going uh, into the details, but I would like to, to give a feeling of uh, what this uh, is doing. So what will you do? You evaluate the self-energy as uh, some quasi-particle property. And the idea is that you somehow take into account uh, uh, a great part of the effect of the interaction. So you end up uh, with a system of uh, non-interacting particles, uh, and then what is left over of the interaction is uh, hopefully weaker. And so the picture is that you have uh, a weakly interacting quasi-particle system. So let me compare with uh, density functional theory that you have seen so far. So in DFT, you take your uh, many-body interacting system and you switch to an auxiliary system, which is non-interacting. However, this system just gives you the exact density and uh, it doesn't give you, for example, the exact uh, excitation spectrum. So within many body perturbation theory, you switch to a system of weakly interacting quasi-particles. And uh, the, one of the advantages is this that this representation is, uh, I would say, exact. Or, and uh, it gives you any, any properties that you, you would like to compute, uh, for example, the excitation spectrum. Then another remark is that uh, similarly to density functional theory, we have hidden uh, everything we know about the interaction within the self-energy or uh, so within a functional. In density functional theory is a function of the density and it is a local potential. Uh, within many body perturbation theory, it is a, a non-local potential in space and is also frequency dependent. Now, one of the ideas behind the Yambo code is uh, to try to merge the, the concept of uh, density functional theory and the many body perturbation theory. So this is uh, what is pictured here. So it's a merging of DFT and many body perturbation theory. And it has been uh, described, for example, in this review and in the references uh, which are in this review. So in a, in a nutshell, what you do, you start from a density functional theory 
simulation and you use your Konecha managers and wave functions to construct the, your starting point, so the uh, non-interacting wave function. And then uh, you add, you take into account uh, the self-energy effect uh, through this uh, Dyson equation. And of course, you have to subtract uh, the part which is already accounted for within the density function theory. So in this uh, toy picture where we have non-interacting particles, quasi-particles, and then weakly interacting quasi-particles, you just replace the non-interacting particles with the connection particles, and then you have to modify your Dyson equation to avoid double counting. So this is what is done in the code, and here uh, an example of what you can get. So on the right, you see a density functional theory band structure of uh, a layered material, hexagonal boron nitride. In black, you see the DFT band structure, and uh, in, uh, in violet, the GW band structure, so the band structure here, which you can get, uh, including quasi-particle corrections within a specific approximation, GW for the self-energy. So let me remark that each of these uh, points can be represented as uh, a green function with a peak. And within DFT, you just have uh, a very sharp peak, so which corresponds to the Konecham energy. In the many body language, you get a shift, which is the, sh the same shift you see here. Plus, you also see a broadening of the peak and eventually some satellite. And these two effects uh, comes from the fact that the self-energy, again, is uh, frequency dependent. So let's so also... Question. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, DFT, but what exchange correlation functional? Ah, so this is uh, an example uh, taken from uh, this uh, reference. Uh, first of all, it, it doesn't matter in the sense that uh, when you, you work within this uh, picture, you can take uh, any exchange correlation functional. You will have a different starting point. Then you subtract it. Uh, so you can start from uh, the exchange correlation function you prefer. The only requirement is that the Yambo code needs to be able to do this subtraction, so to evaluate this function. And in this example, uh, if I'm not wrong, it, it is a PB, so it's a standard uh, GG, GGA correlation function. But in, uh, in the next lecture, uh, as written here, you, this part will be discussed in detail, so the focus of the lecture will be really on the GW part. Now, here I wanted to, to say a few more words about this fact that now you have a peak with a broadening. And in the, in the many body language, this means that this frequency dependent self energy gives rise to uh, many poles due to the interaction. And this is a, a way you can represent uh, this broad peak. So, in, in uh, practice, can be seen as a, a very high number of peaks. So what you do in the quasi-particle picture, and uh, this is another thing that you gain within uh, many body perturbation theory, is that you can think there is a main peak, so it's the peak which has been shifted to the DFT point to the quasi-particle uh, point, plus you also get the broadening, which is related to the imaginary part of the self-energy. So the picture, this picture is taken from the PhD thesis of uh, Matteo Gatti, and I think it very nicely explains why the quasi-particle uh, uh, concept is very powerful. What you cannot get within quasi the quasi-particle approximation are the satellites. So for, uh, for the satellites like this one, uh, you instead you need really to take into account the full frequency dependency of the self-energy. So one last uh, comment about the self-energy. I didn't discuss uh, the, the approximations for the self-energy. Uh, here, I, what I report, this uh, GW gamma is an exact expression. So this is uh, another advantage uh, of many body perturbation theory compared to DFT. So starting from the German LO theorem, we, can, we have an exact expression for the self-energy. And with this slide, uh, I would like to point out the importance uh, of this uh, W, which is the screen. Uh, well, here, I, I wrote electron all, but indeed the electron-electron interaction. And this uh, is computed in YAMBO within the random phase approximation. So we, we, take, uh, we start from the bare electron-electron interaction, and we screen it with a response function, uh, which is computed with the random phase approximation. It means it is computed from this Dyson equation. Now, it's very quick. Uh, you, uh, I, I cannot give you the details here. But the main point I want to, to stress is that uh, this response function is in Yambo is computed for every frequency 
for every transferred momentum, and then also for uh, G and G prime, which are the reciprocal lattice vector. It means then that the Yambo is computing both uh, the macroscopic and the microscopic screening. And it is a key ingredient, uh, and it's, it is also one which is uh, very time uh, consuming. For example, here in the, the scalability test I was showing before, uh, the, in particular, the, the calculation of Kynot, uh, which is the one here in uh, light green, uh, is the one which was taking most of the test. So this was a, a specific case of this test. You know, the test, uh, the self-energy part is also very demanding, uh, but for sure, uh, also the screening is, uh, is a part which uh, requires a lot of CPU time. So now the let's say the calculation of uh, quasi particles uh, is uh, is the one which is uh, will be described in uh, in the next tutorials. Then, if I have enough time, I will uh, I would like also to say a few words about uh, the Bethesda equation. So how am I doing on time? I guess I can go on if I don't hear any complaint. So the, the second part is about the Betis Alpeter equation. You are not going to see any tutorial about uh, this today, but it's uh, say one of the two main features of the code, or at least the two features from which the code started, and is the ability to describe uh, excitons. So again, in a nutshell, uh, within many body perturbation theory, if you want to, to describe excitons, you have to move from the one particle going function to this object, the two particle going functions. So you have this number one, two, three, four means that uh, so one means uh, position, time, uh, and spin index. And then, uh, in particular, from these two particle green function, define uh, this uh, L propagator, which will describe the electronal uh, propagation. So you you have a zero order term, which you have an independent uh, electron and those uh, plus uh, all the interaction which comes again from the Gelman LO theorem applied uh, to this G two. So via the gelman theorem, you can define a kernel similarly to the, what we did for the self-energy. And indeed, this kernel has, again, an exact expression, which is the functional derivative of the self-energy. And uh, it describes uh, a strong interaction. So this is, uh, say, even a classical direct interaction between uh, quasi-electrons and quasi -os. And again, this uh, two particle propagator has a Lehman representation whose poles uh, are the excitations of the system. So, the way it is uh, solved uh, in, uh, in Yambo is uh, starting from the Dyson equation for this uh, two particle propagator. Here you have the kernel, and here you have the your zero order term, so non interacting uh, quasi particles. You have to specify an approximation for the kernel. And here at variance with the self energy, we always uh, work within uh, the frequency independent uh, frequency independent approximation, and it contains in particular two terms, uh, an electronal exchange term uh, and the direct electron interaction. So you can rewrite uh, this equation as an eigenvalue problem, uh, and then you get uh, this uh, eigenvector uh, and eigenenergies, which are the exciton uh, energies and wave functions. And then you can plot uh, either in reciprocal space uh, or in real space uh, the excitonic wave function. So you have a, a brief overview of everything we have seen so far. So the idea is, is you start from a DFT calculation, you get uh, also mass structure, which is, which is the condition one, is not even physical. Then you apply many body perturbation theory within usually this GW approximation. You get uh, a physical mass structure, which describes photo emission. And then with, within the beta salpeter equation, uh, you also uh, get a neutral excitation. That is when you move an electron from the valence uh, to the conduction band, and it takes into account the electron interaction. So here, I, I would like just to, to point out that uh, this beta salpeter approach for optics works in a wider range of materials. Here on the left, you have uh, two bulk materials, a standard bulk uh, a semiconductor and uh, an insulator. And here, two layered material. Here, the bulk version, hexagonal boron nitride, and here is a, a a one dimensional, two dimensional version, so one monolayer of molybdenum disulfite. And the picture you always get is that you have a quasi particle gap. And then, uh, so this uh, dashed line, for example, is the non interacting electronal uh, absorption. And then you have a shift uh, towards uh, the excitonic absorption. Here is in red uh, due to the exciton binding energy. 
and it gives a very good description of the experiment here for it works for silicon for lithium fluoride where it has a very strong uh, bound exciton so here is a quasi particle gap uh, but also for 2d materials here is a, a comparison uh, in between the optical spectrum of MOS 2 and the simulation of one which the YAMO code and you can get the spectrum and then analyze uh, the different peaks uh, so you can plot the excitonic wave function either in real space uh, or uh, also in reciprocal space, your two examples. And uh, with that, uh, I'm done with the presentation. I would like to thank you for your attention. And here also there is a, a full list of the developers, uh, just to acknowledge everyone present the past developers of the, the Yambo code. And uh, if you have any question, please. OK, so I'm Daniel Versano from the Institute of Nanoscience Italian yeah. Research Council in, uh, in Modena. And uh, what I will talk, I will provide a very brief uh, introduction on the GW uh, approximation. Some concepts have been already uh, given by Davide before. I will repeat some of them just uh, uh, to um, fix main ideas. I will not go through formal definition, formal derivation, uh, but I will try to convey some uh, concept, some message. And then uh, I will go uh, through uh, more, I mean, how a GW calculation is done in practice. And uh, as you will see, there are several uh, approximations entering uh, in, a, in a real life uh, calculation. So let me start. Uh, okay. Uh, so the first uh, definition I want to give is to distinguish between uh, what uh, they are called in the jargon, the charge excitation, with respect to neutral excitation. With charged excitation, uh, we mean essentially a photomission experiment. We have uh, light and electron ejected from the system. So this is a, a direct photomission, and this is a way we have to investigate the electronic structure of a material. Inverse photomission is, uh, is the inverse. Let's say it's an electron coming to the system. So the electron enters uh, in uh, in our system and, and a photon is uh, uh, emitted. Neutral excitation we intend instead the absorption. I mean, we have an electron promoted to the balance to the conduction bands, uh, and so an electrons remains into the materials and uh, there will be a hole that rests behind uh, the excited uh, electron. And these are two different kinds of excitation that requires a different treatment. Uh, so again, uh, with uh, direct direct photomissions, uh, what's the quantity we measure? Essentially, we know uh, the energy of the incoming photon. We can measure the kinetic energy of the outgoing electron, and from these two quantity, we can uh, uh, measure essentially the in initial and final states that will be the our system with n electrons. And the final states, our system will be n minus one uh, electron. Uh, then, if we include in this uh, uh, in this uh, set of equation also the uh, momentum distribution, we can have uh, what is an angle uh, resolved photomission experiment. So essentially, band structure. The way we experimentally we investigate band structure of uh, of a material. Okay, the same exactly the same with the inverse photomission, but now. In each and final states, they will contain n and n plus one uh, electrons. Uh, okay, we will not talk about uh, absorption, that are the neutral excitation. Some flavor has been given uh, by uh, by Davide, but here the important concept is that the initial and final states both contain the same number of uh, electrons. Um, okay, what is the workhorse? Uh, that we have for electronic structure uh, we have heard uh, during the last two days is density functional theory uh, the, the density functional theory thanks to the consham equation uh, able us uh, to uh, investigate electronic structure with moderate moderate computational cost so we can address very large systems and we do predict the ground state geometries uh, and uh, a lot of other uh, ground state quantities, all quantities that we can uh, express in terms of the density, which is the uh, fundamental variable in uh, density functional theory scheme. 
the Consham scheme, so we pass from a full interacting system to a non-interacting Consham fictitious system, and the VXC is uh, our uh, functional, our potential that uh, contains all the exchange and correlation um, terms. Now, uh, this is uh, uh, the very well-known band gap problem of uh, the uh, density functional theory. So, as I said before, we can calculate uh, with great accuracy uh, structures of the system, lattice parameters, but then if we want to calculate uh, the gap of a semiconductor here in this, this is taken from the famous uh, Fanshee's Garden paper, where we have experimental gap here in function of the calculated gap, yeah, this is LDA, we have a huge discrepancy, uh, about uh, uh, 50 to 100 percent of uh, error. Okay, LDA, we know that is not the one of the most sophisticated uh, functional. We have a lot of uh, functional in the market, but uh, uh, let me point out that this is not a problem of the functional. This is the problem of the theory. So, uh, density functional theory is not meant to calculate uh, electron gap. Also because uh, when we do calculate eigenvalues of our function systems, for instance, the, uh, the, the, the conduction band, for instance, or any other besides the, 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 the home or the, the, the highest occupied potential, they do not have a physical uh, sense. So let's define what is the gap indeed. Uh, as we have seen, we can calculate the gap from a direct and inverse photoemission experiment. So the, um, the electron affinity and the ionization potential can be defined as difference of total energy between the initial and final states of a photoemission experiment. So the, uh, the, the gap is defined as the electron affinity minus the ionization potential. As you can see from here, we are extracting, um, I mean, we are uh, dealing with quantities with different number of electrons. And as we will see, this is a many body uh, process. Uh, this is a many body process because uh, we can, uh, let's focus on a direct uh, photomission experiment. We eject an electron, but then uh, it's not only that electron that is uh, escaping from the system, but also his screening cloud. So um, uh, this is, uh, I mean, here enters concept as relaxation, screening and correlation on the system. And from here, we can arrive to a definition of a quasi-particle in a pictorial way as the electron and his uh, screening cloud. Uh, but as we have seen here, uh, the gap can be defined as difference of total energy. That is a quantity that is perfectly accessible with density functional theory. So the question is, can we calculate a quasi-particle gap directly using total energy? for example, with LDA? The answer is yes. We can uh, write down uh, the uh, total energy expression of the Consham uh, system, of the density functional theory. And uh, here I wrote uh, uh, the expression of the energy difference. So the energy of N plus one system minus uh, 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 the energy of n minus one minus, minus two times the energy of the uh, system with uh, an electron within its uh, ground states. As you can see, you can calculate, but note that the real gap, it is not the Consham gap. Here I'm with n, upper n is the number of the particle and uh, the uh, subscript is uh, the uh, eigenvalues uh, uh, level that we are uh, calculating. So as you can see, the Consham is not uh, the quasi-particle gap. Anyway, you can calculate the quasi-particle in this way. Uh, it is called uh, uh, the delta SCF procedures. And as you can see, it provides reasonable results for molecules. When I say for molecules, because uh, for in doing this calculation, we need to add an electron and subtract an electron from our systems. And in, 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 in a periodic solids, this is not uh, possible because if we add an electron in a unit cell, he will be mean, uh, adding an electron in all 
the unit cell, repeated unit cell of the system. So <clears throat> we need a different theory to deal with, to calculate the quasi-particle gap in solids. And here comes the many-body perturbation theory. Uh, the green function now is uh, our uh, main quantities, our central variable has been already introduced by David. And uh, we will see that it contains the excitation energy we are looking for. And also uh, other, uh, it is accessible, it contains also excitation line time and also ground state density. We can also calculate total energy in many body perturbation theory and the expectation value of any one particle uh, operator. So what is uh, uh, the green function? It has been already defined by Davide. We can define as the probability amplitude for the propagation of an additional electron at a certain time, R2T2. So we start from our ground state. We uh, create an electron at certain time and uh, position. If we interact according to our Hamiltonian that contains the interaction term, and uh, then it will be annihilated uh, at uh, another time and uh, uh, in another position, R1. And this, this is mean value is the, uh, the electron grid function. This is the definition. Uh, similarly, we can uh, do define a green function for an old propagation, and the green function is defined as the time ordered green function. So um, according to if the, the one is greater than the two or lesser, we have the propagation of the old or the electron. Uh, here, just uh, very briefly, then I will uh, share the slide. Uh, you can, uh, I mean, it's a good exercise if you, uh, take the definition of the green function and you insert a complete set of particle states n plus one, n minus one, you will realize that our green function indeed contain the two quantities we are want to calculate. So the uh, um, excitation uh, given by a system with n plus one and an uh, electron and n and, and, and minus one uh, electron. Uh, so this is the expression in real time. We can Fourier transform, was shown already, already by David, and you can realize that with this expression that uh, the green function has the poles exactly at the two many particle excitation energy we want to calculate. So very powerful uh, tool to access this photomission uh, uh, experiment. So now going to a practical calculation, uh, how to calculate uh, this uh, green function. Uh, the idea, the concept, easily, very easily, we are talking about perturbation theory. The concept is the concept of perturbation theory. We start from something that we know. We, let's say we know G note that uh, correspond of to Hamiltonian of non-interacted non electrons, so something we want to calculate, and we do a perturbation considering an interaction uh, H1, hoping that the difference is small. And everyone, it is not known between our degree function, interactive green function, and the uh, interactive green function is something that we put in this quantity that we call self-energy. So we can take this expression as a definition of the self-energy. Uh, uh, from the definition of the such energy, or if you want from the equation of motion of the green function, here I didn't report it, uh, we can arrive to this equation. This is so-called the quasi-particle uh, equation. Here H naught is the single particle Hamiltonian that you can manage. And uh, uh, using the lemma representation of the green function, we do arrive at this quasi-particle equation. If you inspect it, it's not formally that different from a Konechnikov equation. I mean, it's an eigenvalue uh, equation here, uh, but uh, uh, some difference arise. Some of them were already pointed out by David. Here, the self-energy 
contains all the many body effects it has in the consham where we have a local scale correlation potential. But now sigma is not Hermitian, first of all, and is non-local and it is frequency dependent. This complicates a lot the, uh, the procedure to solve this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, equation. So uh, also a K difference is uh, by, while VXC is uh, part of the potential of a fictitious system, the Kronosham system, here we can give an interpretation of the self-energy as the real potential felt by an added or removed electron from or to the system. Uh, due to the structure of the equation, uh, the uh, eigenvector will be non orthonormal anymore, and uh, the eigenvalues, so our excitation energy, are in general complex. Okay, so we know the equation that we need to solve. We don't know how it is made, the self energy, so the main ingredient. Um, <clears throat> The self-energy uh, was already pointed out uh, by Davide. The concept is uh, to pass from a fully interacting electrons to really weakly interacting quasi-particles where we can uh, do perturbation theory. And uh, the full many-body problem is provided by the uh, very famous heading equation. The heading equation here is the, the reference. Uh, heading provided this set of five integral differential equation. Uh, it's, uh, let's say, formal uh, in function of this deep quantity, polarizability of the system, screen potential, self-energy, green function in function of the non-interacting one, and what is called the, the vertex, uh, the uh, vertex function. Uh, this uh, equation are honestly very complicated <laughs> to, to, to manage, but uh, we can uh, formally at least massage them and uh, to arrive into the so-called GW approximation. Uh, here, very uh, easily what is done, we iterate. I mean, these are all uh, um, uh, interconnected uh, equation, interdependent equation. And uh, we start by considering G as G naught, so the non-interacting one. And this uh, means essentially sigma is zero, and we have that vertex correction is equal to the identity. Iterating now, we arrive to, so we are neglected gamma, and we uh, arrive to this set of equation where the sigma, the self-energy, is uh, exactly the GW, here the name of the GW approximation. So we arrive to the sigma provided by GW. The green function is a Dyson equation, depending on sigma. The uh, W, it is uh, a Dyson equation for the screen potential, and the response function, the polarizability is uh, uh given uh the polarization is given by this uh, expression dependent on the green functions so uh, this is uh, of course uh, an approximation uh we are neglecting the the vertex to write to this expression and uh, moreover uh an approximation that is uh, not always but commonly done is the consider as the g as G is uh, non-interacting uh, green function, the G naught. So that is the, what is called the, the G naught W naught uh, approximation. So the goal now is to calculate uh, this, uh, uh, to resolve this quasi-particle uh, equation. We consider G as G naught, and here we have the expression from the self-energy in the GW approximation. Here is the expression in the Fourier space. And for the polarization and the screening, we have to solve this Dyson equation where P, the polarization, is given by G naught, G naught. So we have done this huge approximation to consider the non interactive system. So this is the propagation and electron and, uh, and all. 
so uh, the starting point, uh, as you can imagine, is uh, to calculate uh, G naught and if, or if you want the uh, polarization. And this is done usually with uh, a previous density functional theory calculation. For instance, LDA, we do solve the uh, Cronsham equation and from eigenvalues and eigenvector, we can build our polarization function. Then the screen potential is calculated usually in a random phase approximation. So essentially classically, uh, what uh, we are saying here in the RPA approximation is that uh, in the induced uh, the induced charge to the perturbation, I mean, the system react has independent electron P0 to the total potential applied to the, to the system. And uh, for the one that uh, he is uh, familiar with the Feynman diagrams, the equation for W for the screen that uh, potential contains all the bubble uh, diagrams here, P, P, as P is P0, so this bubble here. Okay, so uh, in practice then what it is done, we want to calculate this self-energy, um, just for convention and uh, for uh, isolated difficulties, uh, we, uh, the GW uh, is rewritten as GWB, where V is the bail potential and uh, BW minus B. You can recall this one, this, uh, this term is uh, what is called the exchange uh, self-energy, which is essentially the Fock term in the r Fock uh, theory. So this is the self-energy, uh, the exchange self-energy. Uh, this can be integrated analytically over frequency, and uh, we arrive to the Hartree-Fock exchange term. Uh, here enters only occupied states uh, in the in this uh, in this summation. And then uh, we have the correlation part. This is uh, the most time-consuming part of. Uh, of a GW calculation, as we can see, you need to perform somehow a convolution in the frequency uh, domain. And uh, we will look at this. So uh, there are many codes, uh, I would say, that implement the GW approximation. Uh, here I have uh, just uh, mentioned some, uh, some reference for each of, of the code. Uh, many of them, uh, as Yambo, they do uh, use a reciprocal space and uh, solves the uh, equation in frequency domain, but there are also implementation in real space in real time. There are uh, uh, several codes uh, that use localized basis set. They are mentioned uh, mainly uh, for uh, finite systems, molecule. Here uh, I want to... This is Bruneval is the MOLGW code. There is the Fiesta code. Uh, there are implementation in Banner function uh, and probably many others. Uh, reciprocal space and frequency domain is Yambo. There is also Berkeley, G GW Berkeley, uh, Abinit. Uh, and uh, this three code has been recently benchmarked that, uh, the, indeed, the, the, as you can see, there are many uh, algorithmic uh, and, uh, and tricks in, in this kind of calculation, they are being benchmarked and they provide the same results, uh, at least uh, for some for the, te for the system that has been uh, tested, uh, some semiconductor and few metals. Uh, okay, here just don't scale to the expression is exactly the, this is uh, uh, nothing more that uh, uh, the exchange part of our trifoc. This is the correlation energy uh, just repeated in a in plane wave basis set. Um, I reported this expression just to uh, enter a little bit on what uh, what we need to do uh, to evaluate this uh, this matrix element. As you can see, there is an integration over Berlin zone. So we have to take care of this integration. That means uh, discretize uh, your brilliant zone and perform this integral. There are summation over unoccupied bands. 
So we need to calculate the empty bands of the systems to be used in this, uh, uh, in this summation, at least in the implementation done in Yambo. There are ways to uh, overcome this uh, summation over on unoccupied states. Uh, and then there is the integration on the energy domains that uh, uh, I would say that is probably the more delicate uh, part. Here, just uh, this comes from a document that is named the Yambo Cheat Sheet. In the HackMD, I linked it. Uh, in this document, that's very useful when practicing with Yambo, you have the actual expression you are calculate in MD level and the definition of the variables controlling that uh, calculation. So this is the self-energy, the exchange one, and you want to, uh, for instance, uh, uh, sum up over G vectors, and we have here the variable that controls this, uh, uh, this summation. Uh, this means that uh, the uh, calculation needs to be converged. So you need to perform several calculations until your calculation is converged. And as you will see also in the tutorial, uh, a difference of density functional theory, where you have a main convergent parameter meters that it is the kinetic energy cutoff uh, here you have uh, you have several uh, parameters you have to uh, have under your control uh, this is the core i mean comes from the sheet sheet i will not enter in details you will see this part in uh, in the tutorial and you will play a bit with this uh, uh, parameter and uh, let uh, come uh, to the integration, to the convolution in the energy space. Uh, this is quite uh, delicate. You can think to do it uh, uh, on a regular grid of frequency. This is very, very uh, intensive. Uh, what is done uh, uh, usually in many calculations, uh, but uh, should be done with care, is to use uh, a model dielectric function. A model electric function uh, that uh, is used uh, uh, in the plasma pole approximation. You um, make the approximation, the assumption that uh, most of semiconductor can be done, that uh, uh, your uh, electric wave function has just uh, one peak, uh, has just one pole. So you uh, consider a pole for each component, the GG prime or your electric function, and with these assumptions, now the integral is uh, uh, analytic. So what you have to do is to find the parameter uh, that uh, uh, of your single pole function. It is, is done solving a two by two uh, for each component of two by two systems. So you need to calculate explicitly your uh, inverse electric function for two frequency. Uh, this is just one of the recipes of plasma pole approximation. There are many in the market. Uh, this one is the gold beneath, and I would say what the one most used, uh, but it's not the only one. Here are some example that uh, uh, you have the, uh, the electric function in blue, the uh, full free cal calculated, calculated in full frequency, and what is the result of approximating with a single pole. As you can see here, uh, for several uh, systems, for several semiconductors, using one uh, recipes of plasma pole and other does not change that much. Uh, but there are cases, uh, for instance, this is the case with zinc oxide, uh, where uh, the uh, where the you have a large variation depending on the model used for the plasma pole. Uh, if your uh, if your uh, the electric function do have uh, a structured uh, behavior, I mean, it presents uh, several peaks uh, in uh, in frequency. Uh, here, there is a breakdown on the plasma pole approximation, and you have to uh, you need to go to more sophisticated technique, either a full integration. Uh, or alternative methods. Uh, here, this is an alternative method we have recently developed uh, at uh, CNR uh, Nano to uh, have the same accuracy or the full integration, but with uh, uh, reduced uh, computational time going to a multiple uh, approximation. 
okay, here again is the cheat sheet, uh, what you can need to set up for the plasma polar cross transmission is uh, essentially the parameter governing the calculation of the RPA, so the band, number of bands, unoccupied bands, and the sites of your matrix, as well as uh, imaginary frequency you want to uh, calculate to solve your, uh, your system uh, and uh, um, to model your uh, dielectric, uh, dielectric function. So uh, once you know uh, now the self-energy with the approximation you want to take under control, uh, what you need to do is to solve the equation. Uh, it can be done in several ways. For instance, as a, uh, I mean, the self-energy need to be calculated. Uh, I mean, this is non-linear equation. You need to calculate it at the quasi-particle energy. You can uh, tailor expand around the uh, Konishama energy and calculate in these ways your quasi-particle energy, your GW mass structure, or you can solve this equation. Uh, numerically, for instance, uh, using the, the second iterative method. Both methods are uh, the implemented in Yambo. You can choose by input uh, which one you want to, uh, you want to use. Uh, here, just a few words. Uh, the problem of uh, uh, unoccupied bands, uh, uh, convergence with uh, unoccupied bands uh, can be very uh, painful here for the correlation self energy. There are, in a way, some uh, schemes uh, to accelerate this convergence uh, here, for instance, the one uh, developed by Bruneval and Gons, which is again implemented uh, in Yambo. You can calculate up to the summation up a certain number of unoccupied bands and then uh, use a correction factor that assumes that from bands uh, higher in energy than B, you have uh, a single com common pole, in this case, you can invert here the summation, use uh, the uh, complete, the uh, insert a, a, a unitary, uh, the, the, um, the, you can exploit the orthonormality of uh, uh, your uh, basis set and uh, uh, you arrive to, calculate this uh, uh, correction. And as you can see, uh, uh, this accelerated law. I mean, this is the quasi-particle uh, correction for bulk silicon. This is done for a titanium dioxide nanowire. This is the plane calculation of the, of the correction of quasi-particle. Here it is, uh, uh, as you can see, you can accelerate the, 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 the convergence with respect to the uh, unoccupied bands. As you can see, there is a residual dependency on uh, uh, the choose of the um, common pool. So you have for a Hagen energy, but all uh, converge to the same value, but the degree, the, uh, the degree of speed up uh, is, uh, is different. Um, Dealing with nanostructure, 2D systems, 1D systems, or uh, isolated molecule in supercell calculation. Um, there is uh, here an additional problem. The problem is that we are in plane waves, so we have a replica interaction. And unfortunately, GW, I mean, while in the FAT you consider a volume that is large enough to uh, avoid uh, uh, interaction with replica, unless you have uh, uh, charged systems and you have uh, take them into account. Uh, GW calculation converge very, very slowly with respect to the unit cell. And you can imagine having larger uh, unit cell uh, could kill your calculation because it means much more plane waves to be taken into account. So a scheme, a trick to uh, mitigate this problem is to, to use this uh, Coulomb cutoff uh, technique uh, potential, something you will see also in the tutorial as we will deal with the 2D, uh, 2D uh, systems. The idea is very simple, so is to consider a Coulomb potential 
that behaves uh, as a Coulomb potential in certain domain and uh, it is zero uh, otherwise. And uh, you can, uh, for some given geometry as a sphere, a cylinder, or a, a slab, you can have uh, analytic or semi-analytic uh, uh, expression. And uh, you want to use uh, this uh, new uh, column potential for your interaction. And uh, this is uh, uh, an example for uh, 1D systems. And you can see that uh, using this potential uh, uh, speed up the conversion with the the volume of the supercell a lot. Uh, otherwise, the convergence is very, very slow. So uh, summarizing uh, in practice, uh, a G node W node calculation, you start from your favorite DFT uh, Konsham code. You uh, solve the Konsham equation, you will have energy and wave function. With the two, these two ingredients, you can build up your uh, not uh, function, your green function, G not function. From the P, you will evaluate in LPA epsilon one one, epsilon minus one, and uh, W. Then you build up your self energy. You solve your quasi particle equation, and you calculate your quasi particle, uh, your quasi particle uh, band structure. Uh, here, uh, as you can see, how GW on top of LDA behaves with respect to LDA compared with the uh, experiment. And you can see that uh, you have a very large improvement and you reach a very good uh, accuracy in most of the case. In some of the case, uh, the agreement is uh, spot on, but uh, I put this example just. Uh, as a, a warning, uh, here it is true there is a good agreement, but this is from the wrong reason. As a diamond, for instance, are a huge uh, electron phonon renormalization, which is not taken into account at this level. So uh, a good, uh, a very good uh, uh, agreement with experiment does not mean automatically that. They, your theory is uh, catching uh, all the uh, all the physics of the of the system. Uh, so these are semiconductor. In a sense, this is a, a, the case uh, of a metal. Um, this is a work about twenty years ago by Andrea Marini on a copper bulk, where a very good uh, agreement is obtained. Here, this is a case where there is a breakdown of the plasma pole approximation, as in general there is for metals as uh, you have a uh, uh, plasmonic uh, peak at low energy and one pole is not uh, enough to describe uh, your screening. Uh, this is an example that you can also calculate total energy, uh, starting from once you have your uh, green function. This is the example of the electron gas, the 3D electron gas, where the GW at least for uh, uh, high density is uh, um, very provide very good result when compared with the exact one, the quantum Monte Carlo one. This is another example of total energy where you can see that the GW catch uh, Van der Waals dispersions. Uh, again, on total energy, you can also calculate, uh, uh, even if it's much more cumbersome, uh, lattice parameters. In this case, you uh, very good lattice uh, parameter estimation, but essentially is not that. I mean, GGA is also able and much more, uh, much less uh, mm, uh, cumbersome to obtain this kind of, uh, of quantity. Of course, if you want to calculate also electronic properties as uh, the gap, as you can see, the, uh, there is a huge underestimation of DFT with respect to the GW, uh, the GW calculation. Uh, just uh, uh, to conclude, we can think to use our quasi particle uh, energies to calculate uh, absorption spectrum. Uh, you can see that uh, the GW1 with respect to the experiment is very, very bad. 
uh, of course, here in Mrs. Sang, it is the electron hole attraction that uh, is uh, catched by uh, the beta sulfide equation, as was mentioned by Davide uh, uh, before. But importantly, in order to do a beta sulfide calculation, you need to start uh, from GW energy. So uh, uh, you cannot uh, avoid that unless you model your uh, quasi particle band structure. Okay, so uh, here I'm going to conclude with some message. So GW is a parameter free method and provides, in most of the case, accurate results for what respect to electronic properties. Uh, so quasi particle energy and eventually also lifetimes. It is the starting point for social spectroscopy. So it is an ingredient of the beta subpattern uh, equations. And uh, G0, W0, uh, I would say GW in general, it was at forefront since a few years ago. We uh, could deal uh, really small systems, so small, uh, few atoms per unit cell. And uh, I want to say that uh, many body perturbation theory really well behave in extreme uh, computation. You have a lot of number crunching and uh, uh, I mean, you can really exploit uh, uh, GPU cards and uh, uh, computational power. And nowadays, uh, I G not W not calculation with hundreds of atoms is uh, is feasible. So if you have uh, the right uh, resources, um, okay. Uh, not everything is so perfect. So. Uh, if you don't get what you expect for GW calculation, so uh, first of all, uh, you need to carefully check your converger parameter. This is uh, very boring, but this is uh, uh, very, very important. I have to say that uh, unfortunately, the literature is, uh, there is a big presence of uh, uh, unconverged GW calculations. And uh, I mean, this is uh, this is maybe what makes a GW calculation cumbersome. I mean, take care of uh, several uh, parameters. Uh, uh, so beside the, 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 the convergence parameter, here I report, uh, as you can see, many of them. Sorry. And uh, you will see some of them in, in, in the tutorial. And uh, Anyway, don't forget that it's not the theory of everything, it's an approximation. And uh, uh, besides to be an approximation itself, many approximations enter in a practical calculation. So there is, uh, uh, in, at least G0, W0 is not self-consistent, so you have a dependence on the starting point that you can uh, uh, mitigate with a different kind of self-consistency, but uh, the, it's, uh, the, it's a quite a severe problem. I mean, if you start from r if you start from LDA, if you start from a hybrid calculation, we'll end up with uh, different results. Um, then in all this kind of calculation, uh, unless you do uh, a, a real self consistency, the quasi particle wave function are assumed to be the same of the Consham uh, wave function. The screening is treated at RPA level, which is fair, but uh, it's, it's, you know, maybe you would, would need uh, more sophisticated approximations. Uh, plasmon pump model for the frequency dependence, it's not always uh, the best uh, solution. So uh, again, need always careful checks and uh, relies, as it relies on different uh, approximations. Here, I want to I will leave here some, uh, okay, these are the seminal papers by Edin uh, on the method. Uh, these are uh, reviews, there are also books, uh, and these are the two main uh, reference paper for the Yambo code and its implementation. Uh, so I'm uh, um, concluding here. I want, okay, here I point out the website. There is a forum quite lively forum. If you have a problem, you can find there your answer. And if not, you can write and we will do our best to answer in a reasonable time. There is a wiki page with different tutorials and documentations. 
And uh, yeah, today we will see a GW, but if you're interested, for instance, in uh, how to do a better self-pattern calculation, you will find dedicated uh, tutorials uh, in, uh, in, the, in the wiki page. And uh, with this, I, I conclude and uh, I'm happy to answer questions. It is now time for a Yambo tutorial. Uh, are the instructors here? Yeah, I'm here. Yes, great. So over to you. Okay, uh, so uh, I, I will be starting. I'm Fulvio Paleari, and then Ignacio will take over, and then I will take over again. And uh, all the time, Davide and Daniele, and also Andrea Ferretti will be also available here in the Zoom call. Uh, let me first. Andrea, uh, Andrea is not uh, today with us. Uh, ah, oh, apologies. Okay, so it's just the four of us. Um, let me try to uh, share the screen. And uh, first of all, I want to ask you. Uh, so now, do you see my screen here? Yes. Okay. If I do like this, do you see my terminal? Yeah. Good That's perfect. Size. That's perfect. So, so we can uh, we can do something. Okay. So, if we scroll down um, on the main uh, HackMD page, you see here in uh, day three the information for today for this tutorial. We can immediately click here the link, and uh, we will be transported to another HackMD page that contains uh, the YAML tutorial for today. If it's loaded, okay. So the first things that we should do is to set up our directories. If you didn't do so before, as you can see here, this tutorial will be done on the EXA5 file system. And I'm not sure if yesterday you were here or not, but if you didn't, if you weren't, you should travel to this, uh, to this uh, directory here and then create your own directory with your username, okay? So, for example, I am now there. If I do ls, you can see I have my own directory, eu Fulvio p, for example, and Ignacio has his own directory. And I would um, urge you to do to, to the same. And then you will do the tutorial in this directory. So I will wait for like a couple of uh, some time um, that you can do this. And then we will uh, start the tutorial proper, let's say. Okay, so I there's not so much increase in directories, but there is something. So I, I'll assume that you are doing this, okay? Uh, because basically this tutorial will be tested, will be done on this file system where the calculations are a bit faster. And that's good for today because we are going to simulate a system that is like medium size. And normally when we do, we do tutorials, we use the like very small size systems, but this time we had all these computational space available therefore uh, we try to go a bit like uh, high, heavier in the tutorial. After you created your own directory, you will see here in the XFI file, file system, the Yambo tutorial directory. So you should copy this to your own newly created folder. So I will do now that for in my case. Okay, so this is my folder. I just copy this YAMBO tutorial directory. Perfect. And then I go inside. Okay, so this I am in my own username directory. I go inside the YAMBO tutorial that I copied. And here, as you can see, we have all the steps of today's tutorial, all right? So we have already some input files, some data, stuff to plot, uh, everything ready. We just need to run the simulations and hopefully understand what we are doing. Okay. While you maybe finish setting this up, I will tell you something about uh, some introductory some introductory comments, let's say. The system we are going to simulate is a monolayer of molybdenum disulfide. It's a very famous material, right? Uh, the most famous uh, transition metal dichalcogenide, I would say. 
that we study today in a, its 2D form. It's just a single layer. And um, we will try to compute the uh, quasi-particle connection to the band structure of this system. Uh, so we will do a GW calculation, or as you will see, many GW calculations, it turns out. Uh, just a quick recap of the of the theory part of the lecture. So we are going to want to compute this quantity, E and K Q P. So N K is just the band and momentum index of an electron. So this is the, the quasi-particle energy of a cer certain electronic state, which is written as the correction to this uh, epsilon N K, which is the Kohn-Sham eigenvalue, due to the G W self energy. And here is written in a linearized uh, form. So let's say a first order correction uh, due to the GW self-energy. Uh, the self-energy is sigma. You see here we are removing the exchange correlation potential from the DFT calculation since it's already included in the sigma. And uh, so everything in this formula uh, depends on knowing sigma, OK? And sigma is uh, broken down in two parts. We have the exchange self-energy, purely exchange self-energy, let's say the FOC contribution. Eh? And then we have an uh, energy-dependent correlation self-energy, which includes, uh, as Daniele mentioned, the, um, the RPA response function, the dielectric screening, uh, let's say. And so Yambo has to compute all of this, right? And then we get sigma for a specific uh, electronic states, and we use it to compute the quasi-particle energy. So this is the flow, basically. We have to start from DFT data. So we will start from quantum espresso, but we already did the calculation. So we, you will find, if you go in this zero, zero directory, LS, you will find already a save, a quantum espresso save for MOS2, right? But the second step is to convert the Consham data of this calculation, wave functions, eigenvalues, whatever, to Yambo, the YAMBO format. So this will be the first uh, thing that we do. Then we generate the YAMBO input, and then we start the various calculations. As you can see, there are various steps. They're all done uh, automatically by YAMBO with the correct input file. So first, the screening, so this epsilon minus one. Then we compute the two parts of the self-energy, exchange and correlation, which needs the screening, and then put everything together, quasi-particle open structure, OK? We can start, I hope. So again, let's go in the tutorial folder. Uh, we will now do the first step that is from the DFT data, we quantum espresso data, let's say, we convert it to YAMBO, okay? To do this, we need first to load the YAMBO module, um, which will, will allow us to use the YAMBO executable uh, to generate the save. So, First of all, I will I have an alias for this, so which is this one. But the alias is oops, well, let's say you should copy paste these two commands. Okay. Um after you do this, we can travel to the quantum manifesto directory. We enter in the save, okay. And here we see all the value the, the stuff that quantum espresso prints, let's say. Now we will convert this stuff to YAMBO and we use the P2Y executable. So as you can see here, P2Y, you just run this executable. Okay. I will do it now. You see now it's converting stuff. Okay. Now that it's finished, if I do LS, I get this save folder. So this is the main uh, YAMBO folder, YAMBO directory, where you have all the databases uh, that YAMBO will use, okay? Now we do a second step. If we go back to the tutorial, you see that now we have converted the YAMBO, the quantum espresso data, but then we have to initialize the YAMBO calculation. So this is an important step, and it is done by just typing YAMBO, so it's the name of the executable uh, in the directory where the save is. So I will do this also. OK, so what we did in the second step, we generated the K and Q point grids. We generated the G vector shells used for the cutoffs and so on um, that Yambo needs. 
If we now check in the safe folder, in fact, you will see that we have several databases. And uh, now I don't go into the details, but basically the database with the S and S, uh, so are static databases and they are directly read from Quantum Espresso. And the, the one uh, MDB, they are dynamic databases and we have generated them right now in this initialization step. We can check the initialization step because Yambo printed this R setup report of the setup. And uh, oops, we, we can see here that uh, basically Yambo reads everything and checks everything. Also you know? here we have the details of the system, for example, how many bands, how many key points. Uh, then we have all the, all the um, data for the lattice geometry. So atomic positions, type of atoms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We have the symmetries written explicitly. Okay, all the symmetries that the system has. Uh, reciprocal space information, the, the coordinates of the key points. Okay, there are a lot of information here um, that may come, may be very useful uh, later, uh, as you will see. Okay, so if you did uh, this, now we are ready to actually run the code. So what we will do is we are going to move the newly generated save directory and the setup file because we will need it, we will need to read it. So for convenience, we move it to the other directory for the first GW run. Okay. So let me do it. Zero one, perfect. So I move it. And then I also go there. Now we are going to do the last step, which is generate the yambo input file because we didn't talk about this uh, up to now no like how do you give parameters to yambo you can do it in several ways but mainly yambo uh, can do it from command line basically you can generate an input from command line by giving some options and then you tweak the parameters to know what you can do you can just type at this point again yambo but this time minus h okay and now you get all the info. So these are all the parameters that you can give uh, to Yambo in order to generate an input. Since we want to do a GW calculation, now we'll try to check what, what we need to do, basically. Uh, the first thing, so, so basically we, again, use Yambo, and now we give the parameters. So we want to do a GW self-energy calculation. So as you can see, we can put minus GW0, actually, if, uh, I check this option. Okay, I see also that if I put minus W0 and then I put P, it will tell Yambo that he wants to compute the screening in a plasmon ball approximation, what Daniele talked about before. And this is what we are going to do. So the first thing that I do is Yambo minus GW0 P. And that is okay. Do a GW calculation, use the plasma pole approximation. Already we gave this uh, instruction. Then how do we want to solve the Dyson equation that the leads to the quasi-particle energies? We want to use the Newton method. So we can check this line and uh, it is minus G N. So minus G is how to solve the Dyson equation and use the Newton method, right? Then we are also in a 2D system. So I will add this minus R, and it will be explained later what it is. It's for the Coulomb cutoff that also Daniele mentioned. And I think we might have everything that we initially need. Uh, I will add one last thing, this minus V par, and this will print the parameters for parallel execution. It's something we will see also today. Finally, minus F GW dot in is the name of the input file that the Yambo is going to generate. Let's execute. And you see it immediately opened the input. So this is a text file that, uh, that will run with the Yambo code uh, later. And we have a lot of parameters, okay? Like it's a huge number of parameters. We don't need to be concerned with all of them. And actually I will just switch to here. Basically, here in this first part of the input, you see all the options that we gave from command line, and which are called run, run levels in the, let's say, uh, 
Yambo language or like other codes languages as well. And then we have some stuff that is numerical where we should put some numbers, no? For example, these two, these two variables, they contain the number of reciprocal lattice vectors in the exchange self-energy and in the exchange correlation DFT potential. So you see in this exchange self-energy, this is the expression. You see this sum over G, okay? It means that we are putting there 37,965 reciprocal lattice vector, okay? So this is just the parameter to compute these formulas, basically. And then again, we can continue. Uh, so there are also the parameters for the correlation part of the self-energy, which is a bit more complicated. So we have to give how many bands we want to put in this uh, band submission. Remember, Daniela mentioned that you could use a terminator and so on. Then again, how many G vectors we want to put here in these sums. Then uh, this, uh, mm, this variable is used because when you compute the dielectric screening at uh, long range, you have to use basically a fictitious electric field. And this is the direction of this vanishing fictitious electric field. We will put this to 111 to say we have like cover all directions. Then this is a parameter for the plasmon pole uh, energy, which we are not going to change. And then we also have other parameters for the basically self energy part. So again, wait. Uh, yeah, okay, so these parameters were basically for the screening, okay, for the epsilon minus one. So I, I said something on basically this sum is included inside the screening. But then there is a second sum, which is this one, and this one is controlled by this other parameter. And finally, uh, okay, I'm going fast, but you will see them when you run the calculations, okay, I'm just trying to speed, uh, speed up to get uh, submitting basically finally we have this so this tells yambo um, which corrections to which electronic states we want to get and the first two numbers are the k index so the correction is a n index band index and k index now sigma n k the first two numbers is k so we want to correct from the first to the seventh K point, which is the, full, we only have seven K points in this, uh, in this calculation. And the other two numbers is how many bands we want to correct. And you see here is the maximum that I had computed in the DFT. So it goes from one to 300. We will not do this because it's like extremely heavy and it's not needed. No, in general, we want to just correct the bands close to the, the band gap, so top valence and bottom conduction. So we will then change these parameters. And finally, we have the parameters of the Coulomb cutoff, uh, what Daniele, Daniele mentioned. Um, let's say I don't go into the details here. Uh, in this blue box, uh, if you want to edit, there are some more, uh, some more explanations. But uh, the main point is that we have a 2D system and so we want to cut off the Coulomb uh, potentially in a slab way, like a half the distance between repeated copies of this monolayer in the repeated supercells. Then if we do this, we have an analytical expression for the cut off the Coulomb interaction that then can be used to rapidly evaluate it at low momenta, basically, so to speed up convergence. Um, and this is basically, we will never change this ever, right? We just put the slab Z because we are doing exactly a 2D system or 2D monolayer. And we put these numbers and then we don't change anything, okay? And then we have a parallel variables. We don't care at all. Um, we will go back uh, later to this. Um, okay, so basically uh, these, of all these uh, variables that we checked, these uh, five points that I wrote here are the main things of concern uh, for numerical convergence, okay? Which is extremely important, as it was mentioned also before. So first, the K-point mesh. This is controlled at the DFT level, okay? So um, because you have to rerun a DFT calculation every time, uh, every time you change it. So we will not change it right because it requires a lot of time but this is super important 
Then we have the bands to compute the screening function. Okay, the axiom minus one. Then we have the bands for the correlation part of the self-energy, the sigma G. And then the blocks in G vector space, also of the dielectric function, okay? And all these are super important. They have to be high enough. And finally, since we have a 2D system, also the inter-system separation or vacuum space between repeated supercells, these should be checked very carefully. And we are not going to use uh, a converged vacuum separation in this tutorial, okay? So more or less, these are the things that should be checked and you should be very careful about when you run like a real life uh, GW calculation. Okay, so uh, I think I'm done with this part. Uh, I don't know if Ignacio wants to take over. Yeah, yeah, sure. Perfect. So I am going to understand how to stop sharing. Okay, great. Okay. So I hope you can see my screen now and you can hear me well. Otherwise, just let me know. So same as whole, we are going to be uh, swapping from the terminal on Vega and the uh, hack and B. And we're going to go ahead with this first run. So I appreciate that there may, there may be a lot to read. So let's just try to focus on the discussion and then you'll have some time to, to catch up uh, and read whatever was, was unclear from, so from uh, when I spoke. So let's stay in this uh, zero one directory and let's let's use this um, input file that you generated with Fulvio. So as Fulvio was saying, this is something that we're going to use. So is, if you haven't done it, uh, please change these tags to these variables. Um, so it's um, a median random k points, a hundred reciprocal lattice vectors, and the geometry is slab set. Um, so I would expect you to, to follow uh, with the tutorial and do it on real time, but if not, you will have five minutes after I finish this to, to catch up. Then also um, use a, a general vector for the direction of this electric field. So 111 is what we normally do. Um, then for the first round, we're going to do something very cheap. So let's just choose uh, just a handful of bands, uh, 20 bands, uh, for the here for the for the screening and then for the correlation part of the energy again 20 bands and we will leave the size of the screening matrix uh, at a very small size just one reciprocal lattice vector just to to have uh, something running fast so this is what uh, folio was explaining so that the number of of corrections that you want to calculate so essentially all the nk labels that you're going to correct. So it is customary uh, for conversion tests to focus on the gap. As what we were saying, so you only calculate one K point and the conduction on valence band. So if you want to get, so well, first let's uh, get out of this, just save the file with whatever changes you made. So if you want to find where the gap is, is um, located, you, you can see the setup that you generated when you initialize the databases with this first yambo command that you issued and here in the setup you can directly search for the screen direct gap and then you can see this information so it's telling you that the gap the direct gap is localized at k.7 so the index of k.7 you have 13 field bands and uh, the empty one starts at 14. So this is the only one we're going to correct or we're going to calculate corrections for. So we go back to the input and we change this to 7, 7, 13, 14. Okay, so that's that. Then, of course, you I, I imagine you're familiar with this, but just in case you should never run Yambo in the login node, so you, you submit a, you submit it to a queue with this submission uh, script. So this is a minimal submission script. So you have a bunch of um, 
a bunch of Slurm commands, um, then you load the necessary modules and then you just run that. So this is run is a wrapper for the parallelization. Let's focus on the call to the executable Jambo and then the flats. So here we have this uh, capital F, which is the name of the input file. And before we had some lowercase options, which meant that Jambo was going to generate an input file. But here we don't have any of those, so Jambo will actually run whatever is in this file. And then we, we can specify a job directory. So this is where Jambo is going to store all the newly generated databases. And if you don't set this, uh, the save directory will be the default. And then you have the communications directory where Jambo will store all the human readable files, report, logs, and output files. And if you don't set it up, then you, Jambo will use just the, the working directory. Okay, so let's go ahead and submit this. So this should run very fast, I think, something like 16 seconds or something like that. And, uh, well, you, oops, should not done that. Um, so of course, after you do SQ, you have to specify your user, <laughs> otherwise you will get all the jobs that are running. At any, at any given time, and I don't seem to be able to cancel it, so I think I'll just wait. This is one, this is why one normally uses um, an alias. So what you do is specify the user, and you normally, well, in this time the calculation has run. So I have an alias for this, so every time you see CLA, it's just my alias for, for SQ with my user. So it has run, so it has produced this uh, job directory, but if we look into it, we have the, um, all the NDB, the dynamical databases, the ones that are generated by execution. And then we have the output file, the uh, output directory, the communication directory, where you have all these files. And the output file, the report file and the log file. Okay, so if we look, for example, the report file, um, what one normally does is just go to the very end, crawl back up a little bit and find this statement. So this tells you that the calculation uh, ran correctly, so it didn't crash. Of course, this is apart from this is necessary, but not sufficient, right? So then the good idea is to check for errors with the string ERR. Thankfully, there's no errors. Then for warnings, there's also no warnings in this case. And then you can go through the sections as, uh, so this is scheduled, uh, so organized in these sections that Fulvio was telling you about. And it's in each section, you can see what it's actually doing. As an example, I'm going to go to the, the sections concerning GW. So here we have the section calculating the screening. And what I find very useful is this tag, this write tag, that is telling you that in this section is going to write the plasmon poll databases with the screening. At variance, if you go down to the, for example, the, the GW part where it calculates the corrections, you will see that it actually reads, doesn't write, but it reads the screening and then it uses it and then it will end up writing at some point the databases for the quasi part. So that's just an example of how you look at the report file. Then uh, we can see the log file. So you will have one log file per core. Let's, uh, let's um, look at the first core and same thing we can look for example how it is calculating the independent particle polarization and then the RPA polarization and this is doing it for k points one two three and four we have seven k points here but it's only going to four because of k point parallelization if you go to let's say another report five for another core then you see that it's doing k points five six and seven and then it goes on to for example calculate 
uh, solve the quasi-particle equation. Okay, last file that we're going to look at is the output file. So if this starts with O, right? This is O file. And this is very simple in this case because we are only correcting two uh, states. And what we find here is this is the DFT energy, so the starting point for the perturbation, and this is actually the perturbation, and this is k.7 by 13 and by 14. And the sum of these two will give you the GW corrected um, energies. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we are going to try and extract these um, energies with a grep command. I, I imagine many of you are familiar with grep, but in case you're not, we'll just go over it quickly. So with grep, we get an imagined string. With grep minus b, we get anything that is not a hash. So in this case, we, we get only these two lines. Since there's only two lines, we can pipe this to a tail command uh, for the last line or a head command for the first line. And then once we have this line, we can pipe this to OK and then print whatever columns we are interested in. In this case, it would be the sum of columns three and four. And this is how we get the, from the command line, we get this, um, the, the GW energies. So this may seem unnecessary now, but it's going to come in handy for, for automation. Okay, so this, let's go back to the hack and B to see. I think this is what we covered. This is the input file that you should have gotten. Uh, this is the submission script. You can look at it on your own. This is the sq command. Here we are looking at the report file. Here we are looking at the output file. Here we are explaining the grep commands in detail. And that's it for the first run. So. I think it's a natural moment to do a pause. Let's just stay like three, five minutes for you to catch up, maybe read anything that wasn't clear and do the calculation yourself or explore the report yourself. Also, it is a good moment for questions. So go ahead and, and give it a try and we'll keep an eye on the HackMD or if you want to ask a question on Zoom, I think that that is okay too. And um, let's say five minutes, we're going to to go ahead with conversions. Uh, so again, that's going to be a lot to reach. Let's focus on the discussions first, and then we'll give some time. Okay, first point about conversions is that we're not going to do k-points conversions in this tutorial, and that is not because it is not important. It's, in fact, it is crucial, but it is because it is very cumbersome and very demanding. Conversion because it is at the DFT level, so you have to rerun your DFT. So you, your nonce have consistent, you have to rerun it again and then go to Yambo several times for each grid. Um, so that's conversion, but also it's very intensive because it scales uh, with, with a number of K points, it becomes heavier and it is not something that you can do in the time frame of a tutorial. In fact, for this tutorial, we're going to use and of course, at the end, I'm going to mention something about it. For this tutorial, we're going to use a, oops, a very coarse grade grid. So this is 6 by 6 by 1. This is going to be very small and easy to manage. But you should bear in mind, this is uh, extremely underconverged. So just for educational purposes. Okay, and as Fulvio was saying, this grid, so what grid you're using comes in the save directory. And so we already put in a save for you in this 02 conversions directory. So go ahead and, and change to this directory. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. And this is where we are. We have a bunch of files, we'll go through them, but we have the save as we said. So first we're going to calculate uh, the conversions, per, oh, sorry, to converge the parameters of the response function. That is the bands in the response function and the g vectors. So for this, the other parameters, so that is the bands for the correlation self-energy, we will set we will set it to an acceptable 
reasonably high value of 80 and we will converge these two. So the size of the matrix and the bands for the response function. So this is for the for the chi, right? The sum over states in the chi that you saw uh, in the lectures that in principle is infinite, so you have to truncate it for, for any practical purposes. Okay, so the important point here is that these two uh, parameters have to be tested, uh, the conversions has to be tested simultaneously because they are not independent. And if, if you think about it, so the G vectors are the space in which you expand uh, your, your dielectric function, so it is essentially the size of the matrix. And then the bands uh, is what you include in the response function. So a priori, if you include a new band, a higher band, you don't know how, how it behaves in real space. Maybe it oscillates very rapidly in real space, so it has non-zero components at, at very high energy G vectors, and then all of a sudden you need more G vectors than before when you had fewer bands. So this is an intuitive way of thinking about how these two should be converged together. So this um, will be a bit heavy, so what, go what I'm going to suggest is just run it straight away, and while it runs, we're going to, to, to explain what is actually in this script. So the script you have to run is this run01 script. So go ahead and do that. It'll take around seven minutes. Um, let's see if many of two, many of you already. Hopefully some of you started uh, running this. So as I say, it's important that you start because it will take some, some time, so it's, it's good to have it running. Okay, that's right. It keeps going up. Okay, let's let's see what it's actually doing. I'm seeing here it started to so of course you have to converge these variables, so we are going to loop through different values for these variables and do a YAML calculation for each of those. You can see here it has run 20 bands and six read books, and it's also going on to run 20 bands and eight read books. And whatever is is uh, doing, it is printing out to this summary file here. So if we cut this summary file, we can see that two of the calculations run, and then we have a third one, which is 20 bands and 10 read books, running at the moment. So Again, you cut that new one has also finished, and this this will do. So let's see what is actually inside um, this this submission script. There are the run zero one that you have just submitted. Let's go to the hack and for this. Um, okay, so this is where we're at. You submitted this file. Hopefully, you can check the status. Uh, well, this is what I was describing. It is. I, I failed to mention that it's producing an input file and then it's running each case, so you will have a job and an output directory for each case. Um, this is a very nice way of seeing progress in real time, so you can tail dash f and it will, if it has finished, it will show you the last part, and if it has not finished, it will update in real time. And if you do this, remember control c to, to stop it. Okay, so let's have a look at this uh, at this submission script. So, as we have to converge to parameters that are not independent, we're going to do a double loop through a bunch of values of these parameters. So this is sort of a, a brute force approach to, to exploring your parameter space, you just cover a range for each of the parameters. Of course, we could do this uh, in a smarter way, we could just start with a set of values and then increase one value until the gap doesn't change anymore. And then when that happens, if you increased and it wasn't worth it, then you roll it back and you increase in another direction with another parameter. So in a way you can get like a, a shorter path to conversions uh, than in this case. And if you're interested in that, definitely check the AIDA Yambo plugin which has a functionality to do exactly that in GW Calculate. But for now, we, we will make do with this uh, brute force approach, and we'll just look for an advantage of values. 
So we define this uh, file zero as our template. This is a file that we have provided. It's very similar to the, the previous one, but that will be bands for the correlation of energy at 80. And at each polarization bands, we will initialize a summary file, just printing the header. Okay, so what is actually inside the double loop? This is what we're going to look at next. This is inside the double loop. Okay, so first part, very simple. We just define a label, label with the value of the two variables, and then we use this label to define the job directory, the communications directory, and the input file. And we do this because then when we call Jambo, we will specify the input file, the job directory, and the communication set. Now, how do we generate the input file? Is with this set command. Again, I think many of you will be familiar with this, but if not, set is just going to look for this string and anything that matches this will be replaced by this string, which contains the variable of the loop. Same for the bounds here, and it will take this template and it will store it in this new file that it was going to use for running. Okay, so next up is the, the grep command to get the to get the quasi particle energies. And um, because we're doing this uh, in an automated way, we can just with these ticks we can get the value of all this command and store it in this variable and then use this variable to print it in the last step to the summary file, which is what I was showing to you earlier. Okay, so if let, let's make a little bit more progress and then we will we'll pause for a little. So the next step is just to plot. So let's not plot just yet. Let's just only load the, the map plot leaf. Um, and I'm not plotting because not, not all calculations will have finished, uh, probably. Yes, so if you plot, you, you will get an error, right? So if we look at the summary files, um, so these are all the summary files. So the 20 has finished, the 40 bands has finished, the 60 bands is running, and the 80 bands hasn't even started. So what you can do, or what I can do to, to show how you plot, is just get to these plotting files and just edit this list in order to exclude the calculations that haven't finished yet. So this is a bit rudimentary, but just to show you. And then to plot, you just do Python plot 01, and you will get this uh, AU1 PNG. Uh, then oh, I suppose you're, all of you are familiar with SCP to get this figure to your local machine and look at it. Uh, let's roll back this change. Okay, so I think now we we can pause. We can let all the calculations finish. Uh, let's see how many of you. Okay, there, there's many still running. So. We'll give again five minutes or maybe a little bit more in this case. Uh, feel free to ask questions and have a go with it. And, and we will continue in a couple of minutes. So this is uh, the Yambo cheat sheet uh, that Daniele put in the HackMD. I think it's a very useful resource. Um, you have here all the, all the run levels that are in help. And then you have the expressions that actually Yambo runs to, to calculate the observables. And you have the. So in each of these sums, you will have the, the flags or the parameters that control that summation. So this is, this is very useful to match the theory and the, and the implementation in the code. And so. For example, this is part of what we're doing. This is in the context of optics, right? But uh, for the RPA screening, we're doing this. Um, we're doing it at every Q point and only at two frequencies, at zero and the plasma four frequency. But essentially here you have um, the size of this matrix in G space that we use uh, for, for this quantity. 
and we also we should have somewhere around here the bands yeah so this is not shown here um yeah, it's not shown here, but these are the bands. It was in the in the slide before, I think. The... It was in the slide before, yeah. Um, here, right? Yes. Yeah, yep. So these are the bands. So this and the other one, um, the size of the of the cheese face is what we are converging at the moment. And then, if you continue, you get to the and of course at the RPA level, the kernel for for this Dyson equation is the the Hardy potential. If we go to the, so these are some details in the, in the random integration method that you that you are using actually with these tags that you that you changed. And here we get to the GW part, and here we have the exchange self energy and the correlation self energy. And uh, for now, we're not doing um, any of this. But here in the so you have you remember that the, the correlation part of the energy is dynamical, so it depends on the apart from being dynamical, it depends on the screening, it's dynamical through the screening. And in the screen you have the GG vectors and also the number of bands that is not shown here, but it, it is there. And this is the other parameter that we're not converging now and we will converge later on. And this in a way is this NK index is whatever uh, state we decide to correct. So it is an assumption that the self-energy is diagonal in constant space. It is uh, most of the time a good assumption, and this is what we do, but th there is, I think there is stuff done in, in of the diagonal components of the, the self-energy. So maybe Ignacio, before moving to GW, let's have a look to how to copy on the local machine that is a uh, figure zero one yeah, sure. PNG. So uh, I just put it there, the command, uh, the SCP command. Of course, you have to open a, a local terminal. OK, so uh, I'll just demonstrate here very quickly. Um, so let's first replot this with all the bands now that it has finished. OK, so we have this newly generated file. So we print working directory. We get the directory where this is stored. And you go to another terminal in your local machine. And we do a cp vega path, and then the figure, the name of the figure, if you remember it. If not, you can use just some asterisk, and you copy it uh, whatever you want. So it's scp vega column the path of the file you want to copy, and then the location where you want to copy it, which is the, the working directory in my local machine, and this will will copy the, the PNG file. So then you can go ahead and open this PNG file, which is should look like this, which is what we have in the in the happening. Okay, so this is what we were seeing. Um, so let, let's comment a little bit about these results. Uh, so in a way, this is a good way to, to showcase how these two parameters are uh, interdependent. So let's say you had converged the number of G vectors with 40 bands. Then your conclusion would be that nothing is added from 10 to 12 Rydberg is essentially the same, it's flat. So you would use 10 Rydberg. But apparently, when you go to 80 bands, you include some fast oscillating bands that, that result in some uh, important contribution from G vectors between 10 and 12 Rydberg, and this, in this case, the difference between 10 and 12 at 80 bands, it is not zero. This is essentially zero. Um, okay, so for the purpose of the tutorial, we, we will consider this error or this error acceptable. We just take uh, this point and, and move forward with the tutorial. In real life, of course, you, you may want to do a uh, a hundred bands to see to check that everything is correct, and then do a fourteen read verbs, and you will probably see that this oscillates a little bit um, and stays uh, more or less flat. But for the purpose of the tutorial, we will just take this point and, and continue. So before I forget, let me copy one of the files generated by the previous script um, as our new template file. 
So this will have 10 Rydberg and 80 bands for the polarization. And now we're going to focus on the bands for the correlation cell flash. Okay, so uh, again, if you missed it, we are only focusing on the gap. So the quantity that we are that we're plotting here is the, is the magnitude of the direct gap. Then, of course, when we're converged, we go on to calculate the full band structure. Okay, so correlation self energy, we're going, this is in a way simpler because we just have one parameter, so the bands. So you, you will remember, maybe I can show it in the, in the cheat sheets. So the exchange self energy has a summation over bands, but only the occupied bands, so there's no problem there. But the correlations of energy has a sum over states, in principle, infinitely many states, so you have to truncate to an acceptable number of, of empty states. And this is what we're doing here. We've prepared, again, a submission file that we're going to have a look at and then submit. So let's view this um, run02 file. It's very similar to before. So it's long commands loading modules, defining a template, and a summary file. We initialize a header into this summary file, and then all that is left is just a loop over the parameter that we're trying to convert. So a loop over the bands, in this case, these many bands. As before, we have the same steps. So we define labels, we um, edit the file automatically, with a set command and we put it into a new file we call yambo we get we, we grab the out of the output file the quantities that we're interested in that is the quantity particle energies and as an additional step here we are calculating the gap just we echo the subtraction or the string for the subtraction to this bc so we get the gap and we print everything to a similar file so a comment about this, uh, so we're doing arithmetic operations in, in Linux and if you try to do this, you will run into limitations very quickly. So I wanted to put everything into a submission file, but probably the best way around this is just have a separate file possibly in Python with NumPy and you can parse your output with Python and then do arithmetic there. And I think this is what we're going to see uh, later on with Fulvio, but this is another approach for very simple things that you, that you may want to do. So let's submit this. And again, this will uh, start running. So it has uh, produced this, produced this uh, summary 02 file, no bg. I'm going to explain this in a minute. And it will have also produced a new output and a new job directory with this new input. So this is running, as we can check uh, with this. So let's see if some of you, yes, okay. Kudos to those who are running this. And let me see if there's anything else I want to mention here before break. Yes, so um, the Terminator, right. So this, um, this uh, submission file is running without a terminator. You have an optional uh, part of the tutorial to include this terminator. This terminator is uh, the runeval Gons terminator that Daniel showed in his lecture. And essentially, it assumes from a certain band onwards, they have a, a common pole to all of them. And if you want, you can actually let me run it myself. I'm running this uh, this run field three file with bg. You don't have this file, but you have instructions to generate this file if you want to. And these are in this optional part. So after this, you will get these results. If you plot, if you didn't run the terminator, just plot this, and you will get only the plot curve. If you run the terminator, just edit this file, you will have to um, look at this. Here it's only one file in the list of files to be processed. And if you uncomment this, you will have just uh, two files. So 
do this accordingly to whether you have run or not the optional part and what you should get is this and this is to showcase that the terminator is actually really useful if we see the the non terminator curve we're not really converged here we should go one two more bands to see to see what we get and this is a small system and we can do practically anything we want with this system uh, but for larger system, maybe you cannot go beyond 140 bands uh, and maybe you can't calculate this, but you can calculate 60 or 80 bands. So this, this can be very useful and it's important to keep in mind. Um, okay, so I uh, will give uh, another five, five minutes for you to catch up and to finish the calculation and, and play it for yourself. And we'll come back for a final comment on conversions and then uh, take it up a notch with uh, parallel strategies. Okay, so take take a few minutes and, and we we'll, we'll continue. Uh, okay, so I imagine most of you will have finished because there hasn't, there hasn't been any calculations uh, for a couple of minutes. So hopefully you you would have been able to plot it and, and see the results. So we'll finish the conversions part just with a mention of uh, k points and an optional part if you want to it for yourself. So as we said at the beginning, k points conversions is crucial, but it's very demanding and very intensive. This is why we're not covering in the tutorial. Uh, but actually, this is a recent paper, uh, so done by Emily Balsano, who is a teacher today, so you can ask me about it. Essentially, they deal with, uh, with k points conversions in, in GW, and they actually use MOS2. Uh, as a case study, so you, you you can check, for example, compare with our results. So here, with a six by six grid, we get a gap of, of around four EB, and we can see from this plot that is actually completely wrong, and of the chart is is off by around two EB or one point one point three EB. So the difference is huge, and the conversions, as you see, it is very slow. Uh, thankfully. In this paper, they, they propose a, an alternative method to improve uh, drastically conversions of the quasi particle gap with k points. And it is uh, essentially a random integration method for the screening. So it comes back to this idea that the screening is sharply picked at gamma. So as you increase the, the sampling of the grid, you are including points closer and closer to gamma and you're capturing part of this of this uh, stack dependency but you can do so as well if you use a coarser grid and then you treat gamma especially with some well, fitting a polynomial with the sharply picked function at gamma and then you get a really impressive uh, speed up in the calculation so you are you have a good estimation of the gap already at six by six so definitely check this out and if you're interested you can ask uh, Daniele who we have to tell you about it. And this is the optional part when you can actually use it, this method. Uh, you have instructions here, and then you can tell us what gap uh, you got. Okay, so I think this is all for the conversions. So we're going to go to parallel strategies. So Fulvio, over to you if you want to take over. All right, so now we are going to uh assume that convergence uh, like we know uh, how the system behaves under convergence and we want to make our now very heavy calculation it has become with converge parameters efficient no so that's the point on uh, of running on hpc facilities as you have seen these uh, many body perturbation theory runs are very heavy and so it's very easy to burn computational resources right so it becomes quite important to find a way to not burn these resources and uh, therefore to run these calculations in, the, in an efficient way, in an optimized way. And uh, in Yambo, there are like you can really fine tune the way the simulations are parallelized. And we will see some examples uh, in this section of the tutorial. Okay. Uh, so this section is in the 0 3 uh, directory. Uh, where we can uh, immediately go and uh, as you can see well first of all we have already some 
Yambo directories. So this corresponds to Yambo calculations that we ran previously because they were too long. But now we will run more and we will add to this, uh, to this uh, and then we will plot a figure of the scaling of the code mm, with respect to parallel, uh, parallel distribution. Um, so we have a save. Okay, and we have an input. Now let's check an in, uh, the new input very quickly. So obviously the same input for monolayer and OS2, but uh, we made some changes. In particular, you can see that now we are going to calculate all the bands that are available from the DFT calculation. So much a much heavier run. And if you check here in the QPK range, you see we have different numbers here. For example, the K points go to 1 to 19. And not from one to seven as before. This is a queue that we have increased the K point grid. Now we are using a 12 by 12 by one K point grid. And also another strange thing, so if you kept attention, now we are computing bands over 20, but before the band gap was between 13 and 14. Why is that? Because in this save, we ran a quantum express calculation, including spin orbit coupling, okay? One of the defining features of transition metal dicarcogenides like MOS2 is that they have like a important physical effects uh, connected to spin orbit coupling. And so they should, it should always be included in a calculation, but it makes the calculation much heavier. And indeed, since we are now dealing with spin polarized band, unlike before, we have double the number of bands and double the number of valence electrons. And therefore, the band gap is not anymore at the 13th level, but is at the 26th level. So between 26 top valence and 27 uh, bottom conduction. No? And so here we are computing a bunch of bands in the vicinity, let's say, of the, of the band gap. Okay. And uh, what we are going to see uh, then is how to run this calculation efficiently, how to parallelize it. So in order to do it, let's check first these uh, uh, job parallel scripts that you have here. So it's another Slurm script, no? but this time we are going to set some parallel variables into the Yambo input. So first of all, how do we control parallelization from Slurm? Uh, I assume you have seen these with Quantum Espresso anyway. So here we are selecting how many nodes we are going to use in our calculation. We are almost always going to use one node in the tutorial, only once we will go over this. And for this initial run, we are going to use 16 MPI tasks. So we will use MPI parallelization and we will distribute our calculation over 16 tasks, okay? We will use only one open MP thread. So, so far, let's not be concerned with this other type of parallelization uh, strategy. And uh, that's basically it. Then, so it for the submission, but what about the Yambo input? As you can see here, these scripts will take the gw.in that I opened as a template file, no? just as Ignacio explained before in the other script for convergence, and then create a new file with appended, with these variables appended. And these are the Yambo variables that control parallelization. You see that there is, there is a bunch of variables for each relevant parallelized section of the code. So the first dip is concerned with the calculation of the screening matrix elements or dipoles, okay? So, and these are, if we go back a little bit in the formulas, uh, okay, are these raw terms, okay? These have to be computed by Yambo. The computation of these terms is parallel and it's controlled by these dip variables, okay? In particular, we can parallelize over K points, conduction band, valence band, which these are the roles. And here you see we have one value of the number of uh, tasks, one. It means that we are putting all the 16 tasks on this uh, um, conduction loop. So there will be a loop over empty states and this loop will be parallelized over 16 tasks. And this is what we are asking the code to do for the dipoles, okay? Then we have another bunch of variables for the response function, the dielectric screening. 
x x means, uh, means chi, you know, because the response function is usually indicated as chi. Again, here we have a bunch of let's say loops and okay in the in the code that can be parallelized. And again, we are putting in tasks on the sums over empty states. And, and finally, we have an, uh, another bunch of stuff for the self-energy calculation. So the last step you know, of the code. Again, we are parallelizing only over this uh, particular parameter, which is basically the number of quasi-particle corrections that we are going to compute. Okay, so now let's just submit, okay, this job like this. Let's go. Okay, so I do check which is my alias. Well, it's, it's a bit of latency apparently. Okay, no, so I'm uh, I'm going, I'm running, and if I do ls, you see I have added. Well, the code has added another uh, directory. This time MPI sixteen. Okay, so because I'm using sixteen MPI threads. And so now you realize, so this one was done with only one thread, so the task, sorry, is a serial calculation. Two tasks, four tasks, eight tasks. Okay, now we are doing 16. It's taking, uh, I mean, it's taking some time. It will take some time. But in the meantime, we can uh, try to make it, make this calculation even faster. No? So we can open again the job parallel script. And we go to the top, we say, okay, but in Vega, we don't have, we can put much more CPU power no, within a single node. So for example, we put 128, which is half of a node in Vega, half a CPU node. In this way, the calculation goes exactly the same, but now everything, I mean, the, 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 the quantities that the YAML parallelizes over are parallelized over 128 MPI tasks. And we run also this. And now, like you should see that the second one should be much faster than the one before, and the sixteen, uh, the sixteen stuff. Now I have both of them. And um, while we wait, we also run two additional uh, parallel jobs at the same time. So we also put, we started with sixteen, right? So now we put thirty-two. And uh, well. And we go. If okay, thank you. And then sixty-four. And we go also with sixty-four, right? So now for sure the one hundred twenty-eight is over. Mm, yeah, okay. But the sixteen that I think was this one. Is still running. I think let's check. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so now uh, I go back a bit to the ACMD. Uh, all right. So the idea now, again, I, again, as before, if you want, you can check the progress of the simulation by monitoring the log files. Here we did everything. One thing we can do in the meantime, for example, is to try to grab for the timings. So this is a initial way before plotting where we can see how fast it's been taking. Oops. Well, I go, I go. What is the past of grab? Well, no idea. Anyway, time profile, I think it was PI uh, star, R star. So R is the report file, right? Okay, so uh, I have some uh, results. So, okay, first I have the um, directories that were already present, one, two, four, eight. You can see how much it took. So a serial run takes, took 25 minutes. Uh, then 24 for the two, then 11, so uh, double uh, double uh, speed up for the four tasks, and then five doubled again for the eight, and uh, and also we have the 128 as one minute. So now this is obviously the faster that we are going to have, and then uh, between uh, basically six minutes and one minute, we are going to get the 16, 32, and 64. 
And let's just wait a little bit that they are finished. Well, we just uh, have one left. Okay. Okay, so you can see we have uh, three minutes, two minutes for the for the other. When everything is finished, we can use this uh, script to basically plot the timings that we grabbed. Okay, so where do we get actually these timings? Let's, uh, for example, check uh, the 16. We go in the report. Uh, Ah, sorry, I, I went in the wrong one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you go to the to the bottom, so it's always at the bottom before Yambo prints the input file, no? And here we have the total uh, timing, let's say, let's say three minutes 25 in this case. But if you go a bit above, oh, sorry, let me. Oops. Okay, a bit better. Uh, these are the like uh, sec section timings, the timings of the various activities, let's say, that the code does we input, output. Uh, latency times, uh, load and balance between tasks, and also the actual calculations of the chi, response function, of the dipoles, and so on. So it's pretty complicated, but it gives you like a like a global view on a, where the code spends much time and so on. Okay, we are not going to be concerned with this, but in the script, the Python script, you can read every individual uh, entry here. Uh, every single entry, we are not going to use it, but you could modify the script to plot only, you know, how much time the chi takes, how much the dipole takes, and so on. And so on. Okay, so now we should have finished. Seems not. Okay, we just wait for the last one. Then I will show the plot, and then we wait for everybody to finish and take a little break. Actually, I can show the plot right now since I already did it. Um, as you can see, uh, so this is a plot of the total timings, the ones that we grabbed, I guess is the correct past form before. Uh, so on the X axis is the number of tasks and of the Y axis is the time to completion, no? as it's called generally, so how much time it took. And you can see, um, well, what we can see, what can we see actually? Well, the timing going down for sure as we increase the MPI tasks. But we also see that at a certain point, like after 32 tasks, it doesn't really decrease that much, right? Uh, and that's because we have basically for this system, which is not extremely small, but medium, small to medium size, let's say, we have already saturated uh, basically the, 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 the way to efficiently parallelize over MPI. So above 32 is basically a waste of resources to, to, to put more CPU. You are like occupying and burning calculation of uh, many more CPUs, but you're not gaining much, right? Well, for you, can mm -hmm. I comment? Uh, I mean, I'm not sure, so sure uh, it is like that. No, I mean, we, we should zoom in probably it doesn't change much because the the y axis is a well we can check with the graph. check the values no yeah yeah no i mean it's not a zero gain but uh, probably you know is not the most efficient way to do it uh, so we have 128 here one minute, one minute. and then we have uh, yeah the 64 i think is stuck uh, yeah what happened to the 64 uh, it looks it's stuck at the beginning of the run. Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, well, let me know if you also get this. Should, it's weird, it shouldn't happen. Well, let me go here then. Oh, 
Okay, here I think I have more stuff, but okay, let's let's see if I can plot anyway. Okay, so here we have 64 is 125, and 128 is uh, one minute zero two basically. So I don't know maybe it's 15 percent gain, no, no, 20 percent gain, something like that. Um, which is good gain, eh? but. Uh, yeah, it's, not a four. Yeah. it's not as efficient as this yeah. first part of the plot mm -hmm. and uh, that's a bit uh, the point because we can make it uh, even more efficient so well before uh, doing that let me just uh, well the last instruction would have been to use this uh, script to generate these figures so let's if it should be loaded still but if it's not you can load again the python module and in my case, I have uh, this alias, but if you check it, it's basically module purge and module what we said, module load what we said. And then we have the parse script. So we have a first uh, uh, function that reads, uh, you know, all the details that I mentioned before. We don't really care so far, so much. Then we have this function that only reads uh, the, um, the timings and some small other info. And then we have the function to plot. So, which are called in the main part of the script. So here reads everything. Here reads the global timings and here plots. So we can just run it like this. Uh, we just uh, give them the header of the various directories. Boom. And then at the end, you should get this uh, GW scaling uh, figure. Um, that collects all the timings from all the calculations. And uh, if you download it to your uh, to your local machine, then you should get this figure, basically. So now, let me comment a bit more on uh, on this point that uh, above a number of processors, the, the simulation okay. is not scaling much. And so one of the points is that uh, when you have a, a computer code, then uh, you focus on the parts which are uh, more uh, CPU time demanding uh, and you parallelize them. But of, of course, there are some parts of the code which you keep serious because they, they just take a few seconds and uh, you don't care much of uh, parallelizing them. And then when you take a small test and you start to scale down to a total simulation time, which is uh, in this case a uh, few tens of seconds, uh, then these parts which are left in, in a serial way they start to wait, and so you see a, a slowdown basically. In the, so you see a reduction in the speed up that you yeah. get. We should mention also that, of course, this is a small system. Mm -hmm. that Daniele showed in his uh, presentation that if you use like a real, uh, let's say, system, a real large scale system, uh, actually the scaling remains like very steep, let's say, very, very efficient. Uh, we were saying that 10,000 uh, CPU basically, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. obviously it depends on the system. Sometimes the system cannot be parallelized more than a certain uh, uh, amount because there is not so much to parallelize over if you have few bands, few G vectors and so on. Exactly, so there are two points. One is the total number of K points, for example, so you cannot uh, parallelize more than the K points you have. And then uh, there is the part of the code which uh, remains serial uh, and uh, you don't parallel. Yeah, and a certain point uh, weighs, uh, weighs a lot, exactly. In this case, uh, the, the bottleneck would be the fact the system is small. Like we have 19K points, we have 128 CPUs, we cannot put 128 CPUs, we can only put 19, let's say, no? And um, so this is more or less what is happening. But uh, when you see this, be the system small or large scale, uh, there is still a way to make this uh, even more efficient, so even faster. And, uh, and this is due to the fact that here we only used one type, one strategy for parallelization, which is the MPI uh, tasks, no? subdividing the various parts of the, of the calculation, what can be parallelized into different tasks that are in parallel. However, we can also, well, there is also another paradigm of uh, parallelization, the OpenMP, right? So to uh, select parts of the code can be subdivided in uh, OpenMP threads. And uh, actually, 
what, can, what one can do is to use a hybrid approach that is parallelized both over tasks, MPI, and over threads, OpenMP. And most times, or sometimes, uh, this hybrid approach brings uh, a larger speed up to the calculation. And this is what we will try to do, we'll try to do now. So suppose that we did this test, and now we say, okay, you know, like uh, after 32 tasks, we don't consider the, we don't consider, uh, we consider wasteful to add more tasks because the gain is so small in this case, right? But we could add, we could still use 128 CPUs and the rest could be open MP threads. So we don't gain any more in MPI, but then we will gain for open MP. And so this is a hybrid parallelization strategy, and we will do it uh, now. We'll try to do a hybrid calculation. So, and since we have 180, 128 CPUs max that we want to use, and we decided we should not go above 32 MPI tasks, then to get to 128, we can add four OpenMP threads. So the product of tasks and threads is the maximum number of CPU cores, let's say, that uh, you use. So if we go back to the, to the parallel submission script, now I will do it also. So we will uh, scale this back to 32. And then we are going to uh, add four threads. So let me go back to the official directory, even though calculation failed there. Um, okay, sorry. Okay, so now, sorry, I'm fighting with Zoom. Okay, so 32 tasks. We said, okay, this after this is not that efficient anymore, no? But then, then we put four open MP threads. As you can see, then this uh, global variable, environment variable, or MP in threads is set to the number four. And if we go back to the Yambo parameters, you see that we have some variables for the threads. So deep threads, chi threads, and self-energy threads. And this we keep to zero, because zero means just use the value in OMP num threads. So since this is four, this automatically means that we are going to run a hybrid parallel scheme with 32 MPI tasks and four open, open MP threads. Oops. So we can now run the job. Let's go. Perfect. Let's, uh, at a certain point, it should create a folder. Okay, here, no, this one, MPI 32, OMP 4. Okay. This, um, okay, this should be fast. Mm, as we expect, we are using uh, still 128 uh, CPUs. And then you can check. Odds are you won't get all of them, all of you, exactly the same uh, time into the split second, but you will get very close uh, results. And, uh, and then we can check. Let's see. Should be almost uh, finished by now. All right, completed. And uh, well, we can also mm, check the timing. We, we uh, so, yeah, let's just show this one. The other one, it was one minute and something and some seconds, right? So if we go here, it's 37 seconds of actual calculation, right? And uh, in also, if I go back to the, to here, the, my, my, exactly, also in my previous tests, it was the same, 37, just like now. So between one minute and 37 is 40% speed up. We are using exactly the same resources, right? But before, only MPI tasks. Now, a hybrid scheme. So generally, if you have a large system, so you are, you are planning to use many cores, it's a very good idea to use a hybrid scheme for parallelization and to optimize it more or less in the way that we have seen here. Actually, the, the best, you, you know, balance between a number of tasks, a number of threads 
depends on your system, as we discussed previously with Davide, and also on the HPC facility that you are using. So if you are planning to, you know, you have some grant for computational time or you are planning to run large scale calculation, calculations, it could be a very good idea to first do some tests to identify what is the best scaling for your system and for your application. So that in this way, you basically don't uh, waste uh, uh, computational time and resources, let's say. And you can see that it's well worth to do that because you can get a lot of speed up if you find out what is the best parallelization strategy. It's not just, uh, I mean, for a larger calculation, imagine this is like a real calculation on MOS2, everything converged, uh, could take hours, if not more. So in some calculations with many atoms, other systems can take days. So a 40% speed up is really huge. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay, now basically the parallel part, uh, we could say that uh, it's over before a break and also for questions. Uh, let me just mention uh, something that we kept optional, but if you want, you can try. Uh, when I discussed uh, these uh, variables, we just put basically everything to one apart from one possible uh, uh, quantity, no? and we parallelize all on that quantity. For example, this we all, always did it over empty states, no? like C. Also, this must, may not be the most efficient way to parallelize your system. You can actually switch some tasks. Maybe you parallelize half over K points, half over empty bands. Uh, maybe, for example, here in this um, the self-energy part, actually, it's more efficient to parallelize a bit also over bands, not over just the QP state, which is basically the, the, the sigma and K state that you all want to, cor to correct. Mm, so this is another way to make the code even more efficient and uh, not just for CPU time, but most importantly, I would say, at least in my experience, for memory usage. Because a frequent uh, problem that you may have when running real life calculations with YAMBO is that YAMBO needs a lot of memory to load all these wave functions, all this stuff. And sometimes you get out of memory errors. So, but with a clever strategy in what you parallelize and which you know, scheme of parallelization you use, OpenMP threads and MPI tasks, you can actually reduce the memory requirement per CPU and, and run. So basically playing a bit with these parameters uh, is useful both for CPU time efficiency, but also, and especially in my opinion, for memory issues. Uh, keep in mind in general, actually parallelizing over bands is what uh, keeps the memory low. Well, if you parallelize only over K points, typically you have a larger uh, memory requirement per CPU because they have to get all the wave functions in a single uh, CPU no? or, or for all the bands. Um, yeah, so basically you can uh, try to run additional calculations by changing a bit these parameters and see how the timings are, for example, or even to check the memory. You can, all check, you can check everything from the report file, basically. Um, but that is optional, so we are not going uh, to do it. Uh, okay, so now we can discuss a little bit uh, parallelization if uh, David and Daniele want to add something and also uh, questions from you. So the, the last part is uh, the, the end. We actually compute a corrected band structure, okay? So we go beyond, really beyond the Consham uh, Lagrange multiplier or whatever they are, they have no real physical significance. And uh, we, uh, we really compute what should be the photoemission energies and so on. Obviously, it's not like the converged band structure, GW band structure for MOS2. That's, that was pretty clear, but at least we arrive at the end and we can check the difference between DFT and GW. Okay. Since this calculation will be super heavy, because this time we are going to really compute the full band structure of the system, so all the K points and four bands in total, so two valence and two conduction. This time we are going to 
use an even you know faster way of doing a calculation because the the Vega cluster has some nodes with accelerators with GPUs hmm, that were discussed by David in in, uh, in his uh, in his talk. And uh, using GPUs, you can uh, dramatically um, speed up the calculation. So for this last part, we are going to run on GPUs. Okay, so let's go to the relevant uh, directory, which is the four GW pens. Okay. Again, we have a save, GW input, uh, submission script, and then a Python to plot. Let's go to the input and see what's changed this time. So we are using, uh, let's say, not exactly converged parameters, but uh, uh, more or less in line with what we determined in the GW convergence step uh, with Ignacio. And so this is, a, again, a heavier calculation than even the parallel ones uh, before. We are using Terminator, everything to make it faster anyway. And uh, as you can see here, so the QPK range, now it's changed again, right? Now it goes from 1 to 37. Why? Because now we changed again the K point grid of the underlying DFT calculation to 18 by 18 by 1. Again, in principle, far away from having a good convergence structure because you only have 37 points in the irreducible part of the big one zone, which we would like a bit more, right? But okay. And then 25, 28, basically 25 and 26 are the spin orbit split valence bands. And then 27, 28 are the spin orbit split conduction band. So we get all the valleys, the spin polarized valleys of MOS2, which are the most, uh, you know, important part uh, of the of their physics the, why they are studied and okay and if we now go and check the gpu uh, submission script now for gpu uh, for gpus uh, the, the situation is a bit different okay first of all we are not are going to go for two nodes this time so our calculation will take over two gpu nodes and uh, in a GPU nodes, we have a CPU with attached four GPUs per node. So we have four GPUs per node. Um, and therefore, we will run on a total of eight GPUs. And this uh, GRS uh, tells you how many GPUs per node uh, you actually have. Then, uh, since a CPU has 256 cores anyway, we are, and we are only use four, I will explain why in a second. We are filling all the core. So this is why we are putting 64 here. So it's 64 times 4 is 156. Um, why we only use uh, 4? Well, because basically in Yambo, each GPU corresponds to one MPI task. So the code is split, the code execution is split. And one fourth will go in one CPU, second fourth in the other, and so forth. So forth. And so that's why basically the number of MPI tasks corresponds to the number of GPUs. And then we are not really using 64 OpenMP threads, as you can see, that would be too much. We are just fixing this value to eight. Okay, so we are going uh, to run on eight uh, GPUs with basically eight threads. And this will take up two nodes of the Vega cluster. So let's run it right now. Let's go. Okay, so uh, this will take five minutes, five, six minutes, right? So we are, we are going to have to wait. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, we can, this I already discussed, I guess. So again, this is either a coffee break or again, a question break, or if anybody wants to add something. Well, maybe I can ask a question and uh, for example, uh, Davide or Daniele can reply, being senior developers. What's the like largest system that can be done with Yambo on a GW? So I think Daniele is the GW expert, no? Uh, <laughs> not an easy questions. Uh, let's see what's happening in the next month. Uh, let's say we 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 have ah. been, yeah we we have been able. Uh, 
to run a system with hundreds of, uh, of atoms. In particular, we were interested in uh, <clears throat> titanium dioxide in presence of defects. So when you want to study uh, defects, vacancies, uh, doping, you need large supercell in order the defect. Uh, I mean, that that's provides you the 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 degree of doping in your system and you don't want that defects interact. So you need big supercell. So this means hundreds of atoms, complicated system. Uh, we ran it uh, uh, successfully in the Marconi machines. Then we uh, enlarged the cell. So we arrived about 300 atoms on the permuter machine. Uh, now there are application opens for the new machine in Bologna, Leonardo. Uh, so it's a press scale machines. So up to now, we have been limited to the to the resources. So let's say to the to the machine. Uh, so there will be that we start the production in the next few weeks. There is the possibility before the machine uh, will run at uh, full steam to have uh, a big part of the machine or maybe the entire let's say, machine to perform a hero run um, on GW. So uh, I would say that uh, the, the size you're talking about is hundreds of atoms. It has to be done also with other codes. Um, the West code, for instance, in Chicago, uh, there are papers where uh, they were also interested in defects for quantum information uh, materials. And uh, yeah, th that's the typical size uh, of uh, very large runs. I mean, it's not the, uh, I would consider always one order of magnitude less than a, tip, a, a, a big uh, DFT calculation when you can reach thousand atoms. Well, Steve, I mean, a hundred atoms uh, is pretty impressive considering the, I mean, it's pretty impressive advancement. Uh, yeah. Tor was also mentioning that before, I think. And also we have a question about uh, GPU programming. So which uh, languages, frameworks are used for developing the AMBO code uh, on GPUs? And if the code could be run on AMD GPUs, which I think not. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, can I, can I quickly say something before going to the answer of that question? So I see yeah. there are some runs stuck in priority or resources. So to those people who had those runs stuck, uh, play around with removing the reservation flag and submit it again to see if you can get it through the through the main key. Uh, you know what? I'm going to kill mine. I just wanted to say that so these people can take advantage of that. Yeah, the yeah, time. but I'm yeah. going to kill mine to to make uh, room for for others. I had done it previously anyway in the tests. Okay, so, sorry, Daniel, you you were saying. No, I, I was maybe uh, David that can answer to this. Uh, I mean, uh, now the, the the language is the CUDA Fortran, and we are working open ACC. Uh, we are still waiting from open MPI five, MPI five, uh, but maybe David can add something. Well, yeah, I mean, you basically said the the most important thing. So the we started from CUDA Fortran, and actually. Andrea Ferretti is the expert here. So that works on NVIDIA GPUs. And now we are presently working on OpenACC because CUDA Fortran just works with the MV Fortran compiler, so with the NVIDIA compiler. Now we are working on OpenACC, which is in principle supported also by G Fortran and should be agnostic on the, on the card. But so far, uh, let's say we have been able to run uh, using OpenACC on NVIDIA cards uh, and with the MV4 compiler. Uh, we are trying on NVIDIA cards with uh, the G4 compilers. Uh, and for uh, AMD cards, uh, we, we are also trying that, but uh, we were not able yet to, to have that in place. Then OpenMP5 is uh, another uh, framework uh, that uh, let's say that we are exploring, uh, but it is not uh, yet uh, ready in uh, the Yambo source. But uh, yeah, I would like to say that uh, this is uh, exactly the, the main focus uh, of this uh, Max uh, Center of Excellence. Uh, so for the next years, uh, 
Yambo and also the other codes, uh, which are the Max flag flagship codes, uh, will be strongly developed in, uh, in this direction so that they will be able to run uh, both on NVIDIA and on AMD cards. And another thing, so I'm asking another question. <laughs> um, so, so far, actually, we discussed a, sp a specific uh, uh, flavor, let's say, of the GW approximation, which is the most commonly used. It's called the G0, W0 um, approximation, right? So in this uh, framework, uh, what we are doing is updating the eigenvalues, so the band energies, but we are not uh, updating the wave functions, the electronic wave functions. So we are still using CONSHAM uh, single particle wave functions, which we assume they are good enough as computed with the exchange correlation functional that you use, right? So it's good enough starting point. And we just at first order are correcting the energy values, right? One could ask like, uh, if it is good enough for materials and if there is a way to update also the wave functions or to go beyond first order correction of the uh, energy values. No? And this is what is normally called self-consistent GW. And maybe a question can be, what, what can Yambo do uh, in this respect? I can answer if you want. So, uh, as you say, the, the main the workhorse is in general W naught. So, what, what can be done easily, uh, and uh, Yambo does, uh, if you want, uh, is to go through partial set consistency. That means that you keep going, uh, updating. I mean, you do a G naught W naught, and uh, with the corrected quasi particle, you plug in again in a self consistent loop. In recalculated either the grid function, either the uh, screen potential, either both of them, and uh, usually it it, uh, it converges very fast, three or four iteration, and uh, yeah, in this way you mitigate the problem of the starting uh, point. So the the functional you choose at the beginning of your calculation. So that's also benchmark it, so you can. Uh, Either you start from an hybrid or you start from a semi local, the self consistency mitigates the problem of the, of the starting point. Um, then there are theoretical considerations to do about the self consistency, if it is, makes sense to update both or just the G and leaving in Dutch W, but okay. Uh, in, this, in this procedure, anyway, the wave functions again are not touched. You can do a more uh, a self consistency updating uh, also the the wave function. This means you want to calculate of diagonal elements of your quantity or your self energies, and uh, Yambo does it uh, at the cos x level, so essentially static GW. Uh, and, uh, this is uh, implemented and released. It is in the GPL version of the code. Uh, what we are doing now, it's pretty finished, we need to test, it's a very recent development that uh, we have implemented uh, the recipes of uh, Mark van Schiffsgarden and Kotani, that is called uh, quasi-particle self-consistent GW. And uh, I mean, this is, uh, this is a development, uh, essentially what you do is uh, to um, calculate uh, of diagonal element of uh, uh, self energy that it is uh, uh, hermitianized somehow. Uh, in this way, you can diagonalize your full matrix and uh, calculate uh, a new wave function. Um, this is under development, something that uh, we did two weeks ago, we started to do, but it was uh, quite, it was not difficult to, to, to implement in, uh, in Yambo and uh, we need uh, to, to test it. Uh, how it is done? It is done uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in the basis set of the Konshan wave function. So what you obtain are coefficients and your new wave function will be linear combination of the original Konshan wave function. Of course, you add a degree of complexity in your calculation. So they are 
heavier than a W naught calculation. Okay. Thanks. I think we can uh, we can uh, keep going. So we are almost at the end. Basically, we have uh, finished our bench structure calculation. Should be in this uh, directory GW bands. So here we have all the databases that Yambo has produced, and in particular we have the ndb.qp that contains the quasi-particle corrections. And this is a non-humanoidable form, but is useful because it can be imported in a subsequent calculation, like a BSC exiton calculation, that would uh, basically require this file uh, in order to use the quasi-particle corrected uh, electronic energies uh to start but then we have also a human readable file this one uh this time is a uh, we have more stuff than uh, than when we were correcting just the gap right uh we have all the key points the various bands uh, and then the corrections okay so now we want to visualize it on a band structure and the first thing we can do is to do a bit of post-processing and uh, interpolate these values. Remember, they are only like 37 points, no? So we can decide to interpolate them along the high symmetry lines of the Villain zone, and then in this way, compute a band, visualize, let's say, a band structure. Uh, there are various ways to do this. What a uh, fast way is to use uh, YPP, which is another YAMBO executable that is used for post processing in this case, right? So First thing to do is to load the Yambo module in order to be able to use uh, YPP, okay? Uh, so in my case, I have an alias. And after we did it, basically, again, we can check uh, uh, with YPP minus H this time, the various functionalities, right? And uh, in this case, you see we have electron here, so we are concerned with electrons, so we can get more specific help. help. We are concerned with bands, right? So we can generate an input uh, using the electron option. So YPP can be minus electron, but also minus S, which is the short option, and B. And then we can call it uh, YPP bands dot in for example okay uh, actually i added it already so this is already the edited version of the file and the changes between what you got and this is what you have to edit in particular the first variable that we edit here is this one in that mode and we say we want to interpolate with the bolster uh, approach of interpolation which gives uh, normally a smoother uh, looking band structure right so we use this uh, this uh, scheme then which bands uh, we want to interpolate well we computed only between uh, 25 and 28 because those were the bands we wanted to visualize so we put 25 to 28 also here then how many points we want to add uh, in a single uh, high symmetry direction and here we put 100 and uh, then which uh, ah sorry do not consider this this i will comment it we will add it later and uh, which symmetry directions we are considering well these are supplied by uh giving the k point coordinates inside the okay so you kind of have to know which are the coordinates of the high symmetry points in your real and so on so for example in this case zero 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 obviously that is the gamma point so it's quite easy but then we have 0, 0 0.5, 0. So if you are experienced with the hexagonal Brillouin zone zones, you know that this is the M point. So it is the center of the side of the hexagon. And uh, then we have one third, one third, zero. Again, this is the K point, which is the vertex of the hexagon. And finally, we go back to gamma. So this is a circuit, gamma, M, K, gamma, okay? So after you edited the, the file in this way, we can run YPP. So YPP, again, this time 
we provide him with the file and we run it. So here he's, it's doing his stuff, interpolating, blah, 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 finished. If we check, we only care about this, which is the uh, file containing the interpolated bands. So, and uh, it's, uh, oh, let me. Okay, so it's organized like this. Now we have the, mm, let's say, the k point length in a reciprocal space and the value or the value spans. And then also the k point uh, explicit coordinates at the end. Okay, actually, we did not interpolate in this run our uh, GW calculation because we didn't tell it to do it. We, uh, so what, what did it do? It just went into the save here, went into the, the database in the save, storing the consham bands read from Quantum Espresso and interpolated those bands. So uh, this we need because we want to compare, no? So let's just uh, uh, change the name of this output file. Uh, let me, I don't remember which name it should be. Uh, okay, we call it like this, no? Uh, DFT bands. Okay. Now we are on WebP again, but this time interpolating the quasi-particle band structure. So let's go to the inputs. And I uh, uncomment what I had previously uh, added. So this uh, GFNQPDB is the command telling YPP to read this uh, ndb.qp file that we mentioned before, right? And the syntax is this basically it's an energy, and you have to find it uh, inside the database directory and the name is this one and the video too. So now if we run it again, it will actually get the energies from this database. And we do it. Let's go. So here, uh, okay, uh, here you can, oof, finished, okay. Where is it? Here, no? You can see in the report that this uh, got the quasi-particle band structure. Okay, so everything was correct. And now, if we check uh, the results, we have again the usual input, uh, so, sorry, usual output, but this time we have the GW bands. So let's just move it to O.GW bands. Very good. So now we have uh, DFT bands and GW bands. And now we can use, uh, go back to the to the ACMD. We did all, all this stuff. And now we can, uh, spoiler here. Now we can, uh, we can just use this uh, script, which uh, probably I can, I, I even have it here, I think. Yeah, this one which is just to plot. I mean, these are just, if you know Python, these are just instructions for a matplotlib to do kind of colors uh, and stuff like that. And uh, we only need to read these two database files that we, uh, that we just generated. We can do it like this. So we run it and we tell it, read the DFT bands, read the GW bands and the number of bands, which is for. First, remember, load the uh, Python stuff if you didn't do it. So for example, this time I didn't do it, so I do it. Okay, and now we run it. So Python, plot bands, we have first the DST, then the GW, we have four bands, let's go. Okay, finished. If we check, it produced these uh, GW bands.png that we can visualize you know, once we SCP it to our local, uh, local machine. And this is the result. Uh, so the red curves are the DFT quantum espresso consham bands. Okay. Uh, so we have the two spin orbit split valence, two spin orbit split conduction. The spin orbit splitting is larger in the valence uh, in the valence part. 
And then the blue is, the, is our Yambo calculation, interpolated, remember, from 37 points in the useful bridge and so on. Uh, we interpreted to 100 points across each of these uh, symmetry directions, right? And okay, for, of course, the main uh, thing, the, the most important thing is that uh, we have a shift, a large shift, uh, which is the band gap opening with respect to the wrong Kuan-Sham gap, right? But then also you could have, and you could see them also, if you look closely, a distortion in the band structures because the sigma n k need not have the same shift at all k's or at all n's, right? So if the orbital character of the bands is different, the symmetry is different, and so on, the shift can be a little bit different across the bridge and so on. So it's not just a rigid shift all the time, right? And this is a bit reflected in, the, in this result. Now, uh, so basically this is the end of our calculations of today. Uh, what we could uh, do is to try to compare with a finished calculation, let's say, uh, published result and uh, we we get it here mm. so this is a very similar setup the dashed line is the dft stuff okay and the, the thick line is the gw corrections so you, we see the features of the bands we get it even if our calculation was a bit bad you no know, 18 times 18 k point and the very little vacuum separation uh, however of course there are some wrong things eh? first of all the states at gamma are a bit too low and this has to do with the vacuum separation, then the band gap correction is not well converged. It is a bit uh, lower than that. And also, is, if you look closely, you see that here, the, the system is a direct band gap material at the DFT level, and it remains direct here. But there is this competing relative minimum. And in our calculation, this is actually even goes a little bit lower than this, no? So these are, Small things, but you see they separate uh, kind of like a well converged uh, calculation, a result that you can trust uh, from a tutorial calculation. And even though we used uh, a larger system that we used in normal in regular tutorials because we had a lot of uh, computational space. Um, so, yeah, just a warning again beware, be very careful, eh? and especially in this system, transition metal like alcogenides is not just numerical convergence but they are also very sensitive to stuff like a lattice parameter. So for example, if you put set lattice parameter to the experimental value, or if you optimize it with quantum espresso, you may have different relative energies between these two competing minima, for example. And it can change a little bit also with pseudo potential. This is a typical uh, thing of these TMDs, transition metal dichalcogenides, that make them, they are highly studied, but they are not, so easy to study, let's say. Um, and that's it. So uh, yeah, there's also the reference uh, here from this paper. Uh, also, this was done with Yambo, eh, by the way, this, uh, this result. And uh, I think with this, uh, we, have, uh, we have finished. There is now space for comments, questions, uh, and so on. Question from, from chat. Where can I find the band gap of GW band structure? Okay, so this you can, for example, uh, extract it uh, with a grep command, basically, as, uh, as Ignacio was showing. Now, let me just... Uh, well, you can if it is calculated. If it is interpolated, uh, it's a little bit tricky. Ah, yeah, okay. No, I mean, in the, yeah, in the figure, you can visually find it, let's say. But uh, to check it, you should uh, do a proper GW calculation, not interpolation at the point where the band or points where the band gap is right so in this case is the k point and uh, in our grid is the 37th point yeah. so if we go there and we check the output oopsie too much we know that is basically it's the difference between these two right so as Ignacio explained, we have here the, mm, uh, the Consham values. Here we have the GW correction. So you have to sum up uh, 0 and 0 0.014 for the valence, sum up these and these for the conduction, then make the difference. And this is the GW band gap in this case. No? But we know already that this is the top valence, this is the bottom conduction, and this is the place where the band gap is. 
in general, of course, like this is simple because in an hexagonal Bilouin zone, the K point is always the last point in a traditionally generated uh, Monkos park grids. So if you know the gap is the K point, you just go to the last point, right?